I'll call the meeting to order at 4 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, and it is open to the public. I will turn to my colleague, Trustee Hunt. Uh, do we have any uh, requests for public input on um, closed session items only? Yes, Mr. President, we do not. Okay, at this time at 4 p.m., we adjourn the meeting to closed session and will re return at 5.30 p.m. Thank you.
Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, April 27th. I'm calling the meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you'd like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. A limited overflow meeting uh, room with a television monitor is available since we are at capacity here in the board meeting. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed uh, on our YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will be happy to assist you. I'd like to mention that our student board member, Lauren Briscoe, is unable to attend, but we look forward to seeing her at the next meeting in May. At this time, I'm going to report on actions from closed session. In, uh, in closed session, the board voted unanimously to ratify a separation agreement with one certified employee, employee number 266747. Also in closed session, the board took action to approve the hiring of several management positions. Principals were approved for Gage Middle School, Earhart Middle School, Chamawa Middle School, Kennedy Elementary School, and the new Casablanca Elementary School, as well as the Director of Professional Growth Systems. I'll now turn it over to Superintendent Hill to share with us uh, more information about these candidates. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Our first new principal is Dr. Lisa Kales. Lisa started as an elementary, as an, uh, in RUSD as an elementary student, but as an employee, she has been with RUSD since 1994. She started as a language arts and history teacher at University Heights Middle School, then transitioned to Martin Luther King High School as an English teacher. As an administrator, Lisa served as the 7 through 12 English language arts and world language instructional services specialist. That's a mouthful and currently serves as high school assistant principal at Riverside Poly High. Lisa's mission and objective is to ensure the betterment of learning experiences for all students in an academic and emotionally successful environment. Congratulations, Lisa. Our next principal is Sean Browning. Okay. Mr. Browning is a first generation college graduate and began his educational career in 1999 as a social studies teacher at Poly High School. While at Poly, he served as department lead and football coach. In 2010, Sean became dean of students at Poly High School until 2012 when he moved to assistant principal of Earhart Middle School. In 2018, Sean moved to Central Middle School as assistant principal working with Shawnee Dahl. Sean has served as summer school principal at both high school and middle school. He is reflective about his practice, has a love for learning new ideas, and loves programs that help build his capacity to be an effective school leader. Congratulations, Sean. And Sean, I'll give you the opportunity to, in, uh, to introduce any guests you have. And Lisa, I failed to do that, so I'll come back to you. Welcome, Browning family. Thank you. I apologize for that oversight. Our next principal is Clarissa Brown. Thank 
Clarissa began her educational career in 2004 as a fifth and sixth grade teacher at Pachapa Elementary School. While at Pachapa, she served as grade level team leader and Common Core ambassador, as well as, remember, as a member of the report card committee, site council, and PTA. In 2014, Clarissa became an elementary math staff developer. Currently, she serves as the principal of Harrison Elementary School. So she's mo moving on up. <laughs> Clarissa understands the importance of providing every student the opportunity to achieve and impact those around those around and impact those who have imp, who have influence on students. Welcome, Clarissa. <laughs> Our next principal is Coretta Richardson. Coretta began her teaching career in RUSD in 2006 as an elementary school teacher at Mark Twain and Pachapa Elementary. Throughout her career, Coretta has taken on several leadership roles, including grade level leader, student study team facilitator, and administrative designee. Coretta has been assistant principal for the past four years, first at Kennedy and now at Monroe Elementary. Coretta is a transformative leader known for serving with passion, integrity, and creating a positive and culturally proficient learning environment. Congratulations, Coretta. Introduce. Okay. <laughs> Our next principal is Bernie Torres. Bernie began his career with Riverside Unified in 2006 as elementary teacher at Madison Elementary School. He also served as instructional coach for English learners for five years. After this leadership role, Mr. Torres became an assistant principal and served in this capacity at both Longfellow and Liberty Elementary for three years. Present, presently, he is the principal at Taft Elementary and has the pleasure of serving in the role for the past seven years. Mr. Torres is a servant leader who is committed to shared leadership to ensure all educational partners work collaboratively to provide a rigorous and safe learning environment for all students and to ensure that the culture of the school is warm and welcoming for everyone. Congratulations, Bernie. <laughs> and now a principal who's moving to director of professional growth is uh, Mrs. Erica Square. <laughs> Erica is an alumna of RUSD and joined as an employee in 1996 as a special day class teacher at Emerson Elementary. Since joining RUSD, Erica has also served in a variety of capacities, including resource specialist, assistant principal, principal at Castleview Elementary, and most recently, principal at Pachapa Elementary. Erica is an influential, experienced, and passionate leader. She is prepared to be a catalyst for instructional excellence ready to support the development of educators and to expand collaborations between school and community. Congratulations, Erica.
Now I'll step out of our usual practice for a moment to share a few additional staff moves and promotions that were made through the regular hiring practice. But the reason I want to share these staff moves is because they had an impact on the positions and the action that was taken during closed session that, I, that we just shared with you. Our current principal at Kennedy, Lisa Gonzalez, will be, uh, be, will be assigned to Washington Elementary as principal. Yay, Lisa. <laughs> Haley Calhoun, who previously served as PGS principal, will now be coordinator in our Innovation and Learner Engagement Department. <laughs> Carrie Brown, who previously served as a support principal, will move into the role of principal liaison. <laughs> and our principal, Gerardo Arenas, who was at Shamawa Middle School will be moving to Program Coordinator in Pupil Services. So, thank you for that time, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. I uh, appreciate those uh, great introductions and just congratulations to all of you again and we're very grateful for your dedication to our kiddos. At this time, our Pledge of Allegiance will be provided by video and will feature Mason Hurst, who is a sixth grade student from Madison Elementary School. Please stand. Hello, my name is Mason Hurst and I am a sixth grade student at Madison Elementary. Our principal is Ms. Astrid Ramirez and my teacher is Ms. Francis. I am a member of the sixth grade student council and play the trombone in the advanced band. I am honored to lead the Pledge of Allegiance at today's board meeting. Please stand and face the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you to Mason for, for doing the pledge. Uh, we're now going to proceed to the special recognition items. We have been fortunate to have such great students here all year providing reports about their schools. Tonight, the second group of students will be giving their final reports, and then they'll be recognized for their outstanding service to the board this past school year. Students were asked to respond to three questions. What have you learned about yourself, your school, the district, as a result of serving as the student board rep? What recommendations do you have for the board to keep doing well and to improve our schools for future generations? And lastly, what are your plans for next year? And what are your goals and aspirations for the future? Once all three students have completed their reports, I will then invite Dr. Jamie Angulo to help us present the students with plaques, and then we will invite the board to come up on the stage and take photos with the students. So we will uh, begin with Jasmine Shaker from Arlington High School. Welcome, Jasmine. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. My name is Jasmine Shaker, and I am pleased to be here for a final time. This time around, we were asked to answer a series of questions regarding our futures and our time here as student board representatives. As a result of serving as a student board representative, I have learned from many different things about myself, my school, and our district as a whole. I've learned from communicating with all of our different programs, clubs, and counselors throughout the year that Arlington is very connected as a community. Each organization on campus is special in its own way, yet we still manage to connect together. Different events throughout the year, such as our Opportunity Fair, Day of the Dead, or our Link Cruise Academic Summit, all allow us as Arlington students to be more engaged in our school and community. With being a student board representative, it has allowed me to branch out of my comfort zone and learn about different programs that I'm not personally involved in. As for my recommendations for the board, I encourage the board members to continue doing well. From, this, from my students' perspective, the board does an amazing job as is, and I hope for the same for the future. 
For the next four years of my life, I will be attending University of California, San Diego and majoring in general biology on the pre-medicine track. From there, my aspiration for my future would be to attend medical school in order to become a pediatric physician. With this sudden change in not only my life, but all seniors' lives, I also hope for the best for all of my fellow peers and whatever their aspirations are for their futures. Thank you for your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Before the, next student, before the next student comes up, uh, our new hire candidates, you're welcome to stay, of oh. course. But if you like, uh, you feel free to exit. Our students do awesome reports, too. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I'll just wait one moment for them. Okay, if we can settle down, uh, I just want to show respect to our student representatives as they make the reports. Okay, our next student representative is Pia Prashant from Martin Luther King High School. Welcome, Pia. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. For the last time, my name is Pia Prashanth, and I'm proud to serve as a student board representative for Martin Luther King High School. I want to thank you all for this opportunity and giving the, me the honor of representing my wonderful school. As I've mentioned in my previous reports, purpose, ambition, character, and knowledge have been the theme for Martin Luther King High School and guided how we go about each school year. This year, we truly exhibited our pack. Yes. Hold one moment. Okay, no uh, could we please close the door? Our apologies, Pia. No problem. Okay, everyone, please show respect to our student representative making the report. Pia, please proceed. My apologies again. No problem. Okay. As I mentioned in my previous reports, purpose, ambition, character, and knowledge have been the theme for Martin Luther King High School and guided how we go about each school year. This year, we truly exhibited our PAC values as we've had a year of success and achievement marked with humility. We've become even more connected as a school and helped our communities in so many ways, from our trunk or treat to our King Hire members program. We are all very proud of all we have accomplished this year. Serving as senior class president, I know I speak for all the seniors when I say that we are very excited to graduate in just four weeks, yet so sad to be leaving such an amazing school that holds so many memories for us and has shaped us to be better people. And it's safe to say that we are, we are very proud of the legacy we are leaving behind and will use the skills that we have learned at Martin Luther King High School and the district as we move forward in our lives. 
To the Board of Education, we truly appreciate all that you do for our students. Attending these board reports and following with REUSD News, the board recognizes our students so well and showcases all their skills and accomplishments they have achieved. The only suggestions I truly have are to keep or implement new programs or opportunities like this one for our students and allow them to make an impact on the district level, amplifying student voices. As for my future plans, I am very proud to announce that I will be attending the University of California Riverside, majoring in public policy in their School of Public Policy. Fun fact, UCR is one of the four UCs to have a School of Public Policy and the only UC to offer it to their undergraduates. I plan to go into a career of public service, most likely working in the government, hopefully as an elected official. Before I end my last report, I'd like to honor the retiring teachers of Martin Luther King High School that have poured in so much time, dedication, and commitment into our school. Please allow me to recognize Mr. Mrs. Peterson and Gless, Mr. Scott, Mr. Martin, and Mrs. Montgomery, the assistant principal, all who have been with the Martin Luther King High School community since it opened in 1999. Please also allow me to recognize retiring teachers Mrs. Blue and Mrs. Birchak. The Martin Luther King High School community is also sad to see our beloved principal, Mr. West, go this year as well, as he will so soon be the new CIF Southern Section Commissioner of Athletics. We wish our teachers and our principal all the best and will miss them dearly. And so I want to thank you all for this opportunity once more, and I'm excited to see how these next four weeks will go as the 2022 to 2023 school year comes to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. Congratulations, and we look forward to following your career in public service also. Uh, Mustafa Aleklik was not, from Lincoln, was not able to attend, so he will get his award um, at the, sent to the school. Our next speaker is Michaela Anderson from Educational Options Center. Welcome, Michaela. Hi. Hello, and good, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> hello and hello and good evening, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Michaela Anderson, and I am here on behalf of EOC to share my experience as a student board member. Throughout this time representing my school, I've learned that although I tell myself not to be nervous, I will be. Dressing up formally is fun, and I should not be a public speaker. I truly did get to learn about my school. Because I am with Summit View Home-Based Independent Study, it is rare that I step foot on campus. I learned that overall the staff and teachers are very present with their students and very much there for them. All of our students are treated equally at EOC, whether in the classroom or at home. I learned to my surprise that we have a basketball team, which is awesome that the students get that opportunity. We also are also knowing that the elementary students are able to take field trips together as a class, even while being homeschooled. While being a representative for my school, one thing I appreciated having was some of the board members come down for a quick conversation and introduction while being at these meetings. It also has been a little funny to recognize some of you while, I, while I'm out at coffee shops in town. For the future generations of students, specifically at my school, I would suggest not being afraid to ask more questions. I realize that because EOC is such a specialized program, it's not very known, which is partly why I, or it's not very known, which is partly why I attend, but I wouldn't mind being asked more about it. I know it's an intricate conversation to maneuver, but I think it could help people understand how an EOC student goes through school. After I graduate, I will be attending Riverside Community College with the Promise Program. I am set to be on the cheer team, and from there, my ultimate goal is to cheer for the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. After my time there, I will most likely stay in Tennessee because it is such a beautiful state. The goal for my career is to become an engineer psychologist because it, because it is the perfect combination of all the things that fascinate me. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Congratulations, and we look forward to following your success. Our next uh, representative is Andrea Gomez from Riverside Virtual School. Welcome, Andrea. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. My earliest memory of the RUSD Board of Education dates back to when I was a sixth grader at Patricia Beatty Elementary School. I volunteered to help for Read Across America Day, and one day Mrs. Newton, the staff member in charge of the event, came up to me and said, Andrea, you're going to be guiding Dr. Farouk around Beatty. He's, very, he's a very important person in RUSD, but I know you can handle it. I had never heard of Dr. Farouk before, but I could feel the weight of the assignment I had just been given. 
When Read Across America Day came around, Dr. Farouk and I had an instant connection. We were both fans of Dr. Seuss's book, Green Eggs and Ham. As I guided Dr. Farouk around Beatty, he asked me which improvements I wanted to see at my school, something no adult had ever asked me before. It made me feel like my voice mattered and like I had a say in what my school provided for me. But what impacted me the most that day was when Dr. Farouk shared the story of his upbringing. It's six years later and it's a story that I still remember because he was someone in a position of power who was part of a minority group, came from a low income family and was the eldest of three children, just like me. It was the first time I saw myself in someone who everyone considered important. So this year, when I saw the advertisement to apply to be RVS's student board representative, I didn't hesitate to apply. I really didn't think I would get chosen because I wasn't even a part of my school's ASB. Obviously, I was wrong. Being chosen to represent RVS as a student board representative created an unbreakable bond between me, my school's principal, Mr. Sorensen, and my school's activities director, Mrs. Hodge. They are two of the kindest human beings I have ever met, and I am so grateful to have them in my life. Being RVS's student board representative also influenced me to try new things and be more involved at my school. My decision to serve as RVS ASB's communications commissioner and director of the daily download has given me the platform to share that same message with other students through the many documentaries I create, to be brave, to take a chance, and to try something new. One of my proudest accomplishments as the director of the daily download is having had the opportunity to interview and create a documentary on Superintendent Hill. Prior to interviewing Ms. Hill, I felt intimidated and overwhelmed because to my knowledge, no other student had ever interviewed nor created a documentary on her. I had only ever seen and heard from Ms. Hill here at our RUSD board meetings. But as soon as I walked up to Ms. Hill's office and greeted her, my fear subsided. She was so genuine, both on and off camera. Hearing her story made me feel inspired to reach for the stars and pursue something that I feel passionate about, documentary filmmaking. Interviewing and creating a documentary on Miss Hill is an experience that I will carry deep in my heart forever. So next year, I will be attending Chico State, where I plan on majoring in communications and minoring in Chicanx Latinx studies. This wouldn't be possible without my avid teacher, Mr. Paulos. He knew how important it was for me to visit the universities I had applied to in person before making my final decision. He and Mr. Shaiba at North High School allowed me to join their AVID trip in February to tour 11 universities in Northern California over the course of five days. Since they were so far away from home, I had never visited these universities. The day before we were, we were scheduled to visit Chico State, Mr. Paulos and Mr. Shive told me they knew I'd like Chico and encouraged me to apply before the extension deadline, which was at 11.59 p.m. that night. <laughs> Mr. Paulos helped me apply and submit my application to Chico. When we, when we visited Chico the next morning, I knew that was the place for me. Out of the 10 other universities I applied to, Chico was the one where I could see myself. It was my utopia. I want to be the first woman in my family to challenge traditional gender roles and chase my dreams, and I hope to inspire my two younger sisters and other Latinas to dare to do the same. My dream is to excel in a career where I can serve my community and honor my culture, such as a Chicano studies teacher, a Latin American documentary filmmaker, or a communications director for a local school district, hint, hint. <laughs> I am a true believer that representation matters. Therefore, I believe a diverse school district like RUSD should also have a diverse board of education. Students should feel like someone who has walked in their shoes before is looking out for them and is advocating for their needs. As I graduate high school and enter the next phase of my life, this is my recommendation for you board members. Go to each of our 31 elementary schools and ask the students which improvements they'd like to see at their school and share your story with them. You'll never know the lasting impact that can have on a student. This concludes my report. Thank you for your time. Oh, that, that was very touching. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, your story and you're an inspiration to all of us. And we look forward to hearing on Sundance or Cannes about the, how your films and documentaries go. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, our last student representative is uh, Ava Stowe from Riverside STEM Academy. Welcome, Ava. Thank you. Good evening, President, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. I'm Ava Stowe from Riverside STEM Academy, and I am honored to be here for my last board report. I cannot believe today's the last day that I'll be reporting here, and it is only 26 days until I graduate. 
It feels like just yesterday I was sitting in here taking notes on how to be at a board meeting, how to dress and how to write. My experience as a student board representative has taught me a lot about myself and how the Board of Education functions. I was naturally a good public speaker from a young age, but I never had opportunities to develop my speaking skills. However, being a student board representative has helped me find myself as a speaker and given me a purpose as a communicator between my schools, peers, and you, the board. All of you, including those who could not be here tonight, have done an excellent job facilitating these meetings, listening to updates from the students and community, and supporting the growth of every school in our district. Prior to being selected for this position, I did not understand the role or importance of a student representative. But today, I cannot express my appreciation enough to the board for the honor that I was given to be a student representative. As I leave, I have no recommendations for you as how you can make the Board of Education better, but I ask that you and the community continue to select board members that think outside of the box for the better of every student at every school around Riverside. I do feel melancholic knowing that the new chapter of my life is around the corner, but I am happy to inform you that I will be attending the University of California Davis in their honors program majoring in animal science on the route to pursue veterinary school and open up my own veterinary practice. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, everyone. Congratulations, and we, we look forward to following your success as well. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Angulo. So good evening. I would once again like to congratulate all the students for a job well done on representing their school. So once again. We have a plaque in recognition of all of your hard work that we'd like to give to you. So I will call each of you one uh, up. And then at the end, uh, we'll have photos. And I'll invite you to uh, the stage to take a photo. So Jasmine Shaker. Come on up. Okay. You can stay up here. Uh, and Pia Persant from King. And Michaela Anderson. <laughs> Andrea Gomez. <laughs> and Ava Stell. <laughs> so I'd invite the board to take a picture with the students. Thank you.
I just want to congratulate again all the student representatives and all of their success here at RUSD and wishing them success moving forward. As you guys know, you're always welcome to stay as a public meeting, but feel free to, to go if, you, if you'd like. And thank you so much again. So our next agenda item is a great opportunity for us to recognize some of our great educators who have been recognized as teachers of the year or classified employees of the year. I'll now invite our assistant superintendent, uh, Kylie Ibarra, to take the lead on this celebration. And then once all four staff members have been recognized, I'd like to invite the board to come on stage and take photos with our recognized recipients. Ms. Ibarra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On? Is it on? OK. Good evening, Dr. Farouk, members of the board, S Superintendent Hill. Um, tonight, I'd like, yeah, it does sound, there. OK, thank you. <laughs> I will start over. Um, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, members of the board, we have the great honor tonight. It's one of the, the joys of the job that comes is we get to honor some people. And we have four people to honor tonight, three teachers of the year, and a classified member who actually is not here, but we're still going to honor him. Um, he actually got to take a day off, and this happened to be the day that he took, and we let him. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce our first, and I'm going to have them stand because you will have an opportunity to... Um, be able to take the picture with them. But if I could have Sarah Renicki stand up, please, first. Sarah is an excellent educator who thrives in implementing innovation. Sarah is a school site leader who fully embraces Riverside Virtual School's mission to leverage technology to reimagine education, provide equity, and build meaningful and productive relationships. Sarah's magnetic and optimistic personality is witnessed each day in her learning environment, evidenced by a dynamic display of energy as she connects virtually with students in order to provide the highest level of education, support, and intervention. Sarah maximizes learning for all students by creating this positive environment designed to welcome and encourage the students. So if we could just all recognize Sarah. <laughs> Next we have Andrea Graydon. Andrea is at Frank Augustus Miller Middle School. She's seventh, eighth grade math um, reading intervention. And Andrea serves her students and the community with an unwavering devotion and dedication. She has student first mentality and willingness to collaborate with every department on campus while passionately advocating for all students. As a content specialist for math and reading, Andrea coaches, inspires, and encourages students at all levels to ensure academic growth by implementing best teaching practices. Andrea recognizes that her best and most celebrated accomplishments are not awards or certificates, but rather when she witnesses her students overcome their learning challenges and are not able to read meaning and unlock an entire world of possibilities that were previously not available for them. Next, we have Carrie Valenzuela at Arlington High School, AVID coordinator. <laughs> Carrie Valenzuela has established and cemented herself a phenomenal reputation as an educator who pours her energy and talents for her success of her students. Mrs. Valenzuela has the ability to effectively design and implement instructional programs aimed at engaging and supporting students in their quest to become college, career, and world ready. The equity work she leads makes it feasible for students to have an opportunity to be seen, heard, and thrive in spite of the challenges and obstacles that they may face as students on a daily basis. One of Carrie's greatest talents and strengths is her ability to build strong relationships. She fully understands the profound impact that creating relationships with students has on their learning and well-being. <laughs> 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 
Lastly, we have Ivan Santiago Del Rose de la Rosa at Business Services. He's our digital copy systems operator too. Ivan De La Rosa began his career with Riverside Unified in 2012. He served as a bindery worker one in the publications department and nutrition services delivery driver, and then moved into a delivery driver in the nutrition services department. Today, Ivan is a digital copy systems operator within our publications department. His current role is not only provides students with the means to bolster school spirit, but he also provides the school community with essential instructional supplies, such as lined paper for kindergarten, classrooms, workbooks, journals, summer mailers, parent handbooks, state testing materials, progress reports, and report cards. Just about everything that comes out of UCR, or excuse me, comes out of RUSD's publications, Ivan has touched. He has an amazing gift, and we want to celebrate him tonight even though he's not here. And as we close in the celebration, one thing that all four of these have uniquely in common this year, and I will say, is they are incredibly humble. Not one of them wanted to even, though, what do we have to say? Do we have to be there? So not only are they phenomenal educators, all four of them, but they also are humble in what they've given to RUSD. So if we could celebrate and thank all four right now. Okay, congratulations to all of you again. We're very proud of you and all the difference that you make. So <clears throat> our next agenda item is something that all of us on the board look forward to each year. The district's job shadowing program has been taking place in RUSD since 2017. And this annual event provides an opportunity for the board and cabinet members to work with classified support professionals in order to gain insight into their specialized job duties and responsibilities. Classified support team members were joined by the board and cabinet members on April 20th and April 21st. And the video presentation uh, that will be shared shortly will include some of those highlights. At the end of the presentation, board members will be provided with an opportunity to share their insights about these special days. And we have several of our team members who participated in the job shadowing days that are here with us tonight. 
I'd like to ask all of them to stand up and be recognized at this time. We'll wait a moment before we play the video just so they can see it too. Okay, okay. We'll, if we could please uh, roll the video. So uh, we have an opportunity for uh, each of my colleagues, if they want to share any thoughts about their experience. Uh, happy to see who have, Trustee Hunt, if you want to start us off. Uh, thank you, and I thank the superintendents for setting this, uh, assistant superintendent for setting this up. I looked a little um, uh, baffled, and I was at the very beginning, because uh, Mr. Vina Sassina, who's a purchasing accounting there on campus, was going over her workload, and it's, it's uh, I'm glad I don't have that job, but I stopped her to say, can I please have some coffee? I need something to help me <laughs> catch up with you. Um, and just a wonderful young lady uh, who comes from a uh, few years, but she was in the private industry here with a real estate firm in town, and uh, excellent firm, I've known them for a while. And she really brings that business side to it all. You don't get a pencil, you don't get anything. You don't get a field trip unless it goes through her. And she works it and was very complimentary, Assistant Superintendent Power, of, of how they work with you all. Um, I did a campus walk. Uh, EOC is very impressive um, and is has a special group of students uh, that they uh, cater to and work with. I was very impressed with that. We're going to be starting uh, a new nursing program there. And so on my walk, I went to view the room. Uh, they're getting their equipment. It's going to be very, very nice. And it's going to be effective. <laughs> While I was there being the hypochondriac that I am, I asked them to take my blood pressure. It was through the roof. And then she offered to do an EKG. And I'm surprised. I thought, well, I'm the first board member I bet that's ever gone on campus tours and, and took his shirt off. So, um, and it showed blockage. Thankfully, I was with my cardiologist in Loma Linda yesterday. He said, yes, it's blocked, but it's not life-threatening. It's really, you know, this and that. So, uh, but I thank the, the folks there. A very collaborative staff, uh, very, very friendly. Uh, Ojan Sykes is there with uh, CSEA and she, there you go, thank you and uh, does a wonderful job uh, with communications and uh, just very impressed, a very collaborative superintendent and uh, always on the right check. Thank you, Mr. Fruit, Dr. Fruit. 
Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Uh, if any other, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Thank you. Um, so my, my visit was a little more G-rated than Mr. Hunt's. Um, I had the pleasure of shadowing Diane Ritchie. She's an assessment technician uh, who works diligently in the Department of Research Assessment and Evaluation. And I didn't know a whole lot of what that meant until um, I got to sit down with her. Uh, so the department's responsible for ad the administration and the reporting of to the federal, state, and district assessments programs, and so administering them and then also um, compiling the data. Uh, so uh, surveys and assessments like uh, CASP and LPAC and surveys like the Healthy uh, Kids. So I learned about how important it is to, um, to have accurate data. Uh, while I was watching her do the very important, very, um, it was very important for her to be accurate. It was very important for her um, to, to provide all the full data so that we can have a full picture, so the district can have a full picture of how well our students are doing uh, in achievement and in well-being. And so it's so important to have the data to make important decisions. And so um, we value them, and not just the, the technicians in that area that I got to really get a, a deeper dive and in, in, in view of, but all of our uh, classified staff. They really are the backbone of our school and our schools and our district and everything that we do. So I just wanted to say thank you. It was really an honor to be able to be a part of that. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Does anyone else want to share any thoughts? Trustee Lee? Yeah, just uh, briefly, thanks uh, to the team for putting it together again. It's one day I look forward to uh, every year to, to walk, the, walk and shadow one of our CICA uh, employees. And I got to work with Robert. He was a registrar at North High School and honestly one of the most organized men I've ever met in my life. Um, he probably shouldn't have let me sit in his chair or touch his computer, um, but he didn't leave my side um, and just... Hats off to all of our registrars across all of our campuses. They're really a one man or one woman show. Uh, and the amount of, of detailed work they're responsible for uh, is pretty incredible. So um, in incredibly organized, I can't say that enough. I mean, if you look at my email inbox, I've got I don't know how many unread messages. Um, not only does he have no unread messages, he has a, a file for it, every single email and where it goes. So. Um, grateful for people like Robert and for them sharing their skills with uh, our, our, our sites. Um, he can find anything that any student needs that's ever gone to our district, I think, moment. So thanks, Robert, for, for letting me spend the day with you. And uh, thanks for North at being, for being so welcoming. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Does anybody else want to provide any comments? Okay, uh, Superintendent Hill. I want to thank my, my partner, Ms. Marcy Frias, who happens to be here today. Um, and <laughs> yes, she can work a girl. I will say that. Uh, but Marcy, your, your care for your role and your dedication to your site, everywhere I looked, it was evident. And um, I appreciate that you had me live up to your standards, the Marcy way. People at the site were telling me, well, you have to learn how to do it the Marcy way. So I really feel accomplished now that I have done it the Marcy way and seen just a little view of your day to day. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. Uh, you know, I'll share some thoughts about my experience, but first just want to express my appreciation to all of CSEA uh, for, for making this tradition. Uh, so great for, as an experience for all of us, but you know we just have so much appreciation for the impact that you guys have on our kiddos, whether it's directly or indirectly, you make a huge difference. I had the pleasure uh, this year of uh, shadowing Erica Wecker, and you know the, the first thing I'll just say is, and I know all of us felt very strongly about this during the pandemic, is the nutritional staff. I mean, over seven million meals, I think as of like last year, that were served. And so even when the schools were not operating, making food available to the, the, the public, and now you know we have a situation where all students can get access to free meals. Um, it's just an extraordinary effort. And I remember speaking with her about their mindset and it was like just business as usual. Um, you know, not all employees were having to go in person. Um, she said that there was just a sense of duty and responsibility. I just thought it's really just uh, very heroic. Um, one thing that stood out to me too is she really emphasized to me about how uh, 
the perception about people knowing, you know, the, some of the quality of the food. And the, we have the salad bar, which is, you know, uh, has a lot of great fresh options and just making people aware of that. Uh, I had a chance to kind of, and to see the camaraderie amongst the team also. I had a chance to bond with her a little bit on a personal level. Uh, she's, you know, been a single parent. And so I could relate from my mom's experiences and just talking about that. Um, she moved to Merino Valley. She used to be in Riverside to be closer to her son in Paris. Um, just a very family oriented. Um, and the last couple of things I'll just say is, you know, they refer to themselves as the soul of the schools. And I, and as anybody who's been a student knows, you know, we all look forward to lunch, not just for the nourishment, but the social and just to have that perspective. So just really, again, a deep appreciation uh, for all of our nutritional staff. And thank you, Erica, for letting me shadow you. Thank you. We'll now turn to our district group reports. And we'll begin by in inviting our, from our parent organization leaders, Dr. Azeen Mobasher, president of the Riverside Council Parent-Teacher Organization, to start us off. Welcome, Dr. Mushabar. Mobasher. Good evening, Board President, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, RUSD Board members, and members of the Cabinet. This is my last reporting to you all, so <laughs> um, I just wanted to give a few comments. Our uh, membership numbers almost doubled this year to 5,839 members. Thank you to all of you who had joined. <laughs> Last weekend, I attended a California State PTA convention in Sacramento, during which time I had the privilege to hear keynote speakers, Diana Pastora Carson, who has been an elementary educator for over 30 years, and co-teaches a disability and society course at San Diego State University. She's a consultant and educator on diversity as it relates to disability, and is the author of several articles and books, including Beyond Awareness, bringing disability into diversity work in K through 12 schools and communities. And also Lauren Camarillo, a 2023 California Teacher of the Year, who is a Spanish and ambassador's teacher at Mountain View High School in the Mountain View Los Altos Union High School District, Santa Clara County. Both of these speakers were inspiring in their continued work supporting minorities and prioritizing inclusive and equitable practices. However, the most impactful takeaway from the convention was through information shared in a family engagement workshop I attended. As I listened to questions and concerns from PTA leaders across the state, the presenter, Laura Borrego, director of the California Department of Education Whole Child Division, who oversees the family engagement office, provided an overview of her division's responsibility, then opened the floor for questions. Now, questions ranged from topics of minority groups feeling excluded by their districts to community schools and universal pre-kindergarten. Pre I learned through these questions, many of our district's priorities are not mandated by policies, but sound decisions made locally to support the needs of our community. This made me proud of our district, as our family engagement programs, equitable, inclusive practices, and strong DAPAC and DLAC are not shared in all districts throughout the state. Before the pandemic, RUSD increased their SAP counselors and mental health programs far beyond what was required and continues to do so. But this year, they also added aids in TK classrooms. I believe giving our youngest students this extra support will have an extraordinary impact on school climate in years to come. While aids in TK is not a California Department of Education policy at this time, I appreciate RUSD for prioritizing this support in addition to the other priorities, which go above what is required by law. Some board meetings are filled with complaints regarding the policies you are mandated to carry out. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for the ways you are going above and beyond to care for our students. I also, as promised, have a check for you for our volunteers' hours. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Mary Beth Loyal. So our, our volunteers this year uh, reported 59,113 hours of volunteering in all our schools. And this will be a total of 1,008,079, 8, no, what? 
Thank you, Dr. Mabashar. And you said this was your last rep reporting? Yes. So um, <laughs> we know you're not done in terms of your engagement with the school district, but really extraordinary leadership on your part. And we're very, very grateful for everything Thank that you. you've done for the district. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to everyone who represents those hours. And we know that uh, beyond trying to ascribe some value to it, the heart that goes into uh, for our kiddos and our community is something you know, that can't be quantified. So thank you. Uh, our next report is from Ms. Maritza Monfil, Vice President of the District English Learner Advisory Committee, DLAC. Welcome, Maritza. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Superintendent, President Farouk, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Joe Perez, Joe Perez, and I am a district interpreter translator. Okay. Buenas tardes, Presidente Dr. Farouk, miembros de la mesa directiva, Señora Hill. Mi nombre es Maritza Monfil, Vicepresidente del Comité de DILA. Estoy en representación de nuestra Presidente Patricia Oropesa y la Secretaria Alejandra Carrillo. Good afternoon, President Dr. Farouk, members of the board, and Ms. Hill. My name is Maritza Monfil, Vice President of DLAC Committee. I'm filling in for our President, Patricia Oropesa, and our Secretary, Alejandrina Castillo. Primero, antes que nada, le damos gracias por darnos la oportunidad de asistir a la conferencia de CABE que se llevó a cabo el mes pasado. De esta aprendimos lo necesario y fue muy enriquecida toda la información. Lo que observamos es que otros distritos estaban empleando varios talleres para los maestros y padres sobre la participación de la educación del estudiante. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to attend the California Association for Bilingual Education conference that took place last month. We learned important information and it was really enriching. What we notice is that many districts are holding many workshops for teachers and parents about involvement in students' education. Esto está llevando a tener más participación de los padres y el éxito en sus hijos. If Nuestra you could please es, uh, uh, speak closer to oh, the mic, sorry. my apologies. Okay. Esto está llevando a tener más participación de los padres y éxito en sus hijos. Nuestra pregunta es cómo nuestro distrito puede incrementar la participación de padres de nuestros aprendices de inglés. Debemos de analizar el impacto que hacen los talleres de nuestro distrito. Ofrece ver si hay un impacto positivo en la participación de los padres. Deseamos que el siguiente año vayan más participantes, ya que la información es muy importante llevarla a cada una de nuestras escuelas de Riverside. This leads to more parent participation and student success. Our question is, how can our district increase parent participation for our English learners? We should analyze the impact that our district's workshops have to see if they have a positive effect on parents, parent involvement. We would like there to be more attendees at next year's conference because it is imperative to share this information to our Riverside schools. Otro punto, en petición de los padres, queremos que se nos informe más los datos académicos de los aprendices de inglés y también el plan del mismo para el siguiente año. Queremos estar al día con el progreso académico de nuestros aprendices de inglés a nivel del grupo y cada escuela. On another point, on behalf of the parents, we would like to have more information on the academic data of the English learners and also the plan for them for next year. We want to be up to date with the academic progress of our English learners at the district and school level. 
También queremos darle las gracias por parte de las familias de aprendices de inglés a la señora Esther García por su experiencia y capacidad para trabajar con nuestras familias. Es una persona que dentro y fuera de su trabajo da más de lo requerido. Estamos muy agradecidos por su arduo trabajo y las familias están muy satisfechas con su ayuda. Le damos las gracias a ustedes, la mesa directiva, por tener a la señora García, quien es la persona indicada para este importante programa. También agradecemos a la señora Chrissy Batchelder y la señorita Norma Barles por su apoyo para con las familias de aprendices de inglés. We would also like to thank on behalf of the English learner families, Ms. Esther Garcia for her experience and capability working with our families. She is someone that gives more than what is required both in and outside of work. We are really thankful for her and her hard work and the families are really satisfied with her help. We thank you, the board, for having Ms. Garcia to run this important program. We would also like to thank Ms. Christy Batchelder and Ms. Norma Barley for their support, for the support they give to our English learner families. En otra nota, nuestra junta de DILA y las familias continúan compartiendo preocupaciones sobre el comportamiento en las escuelas. Es importante que los padres sepan sobre esto. Últimamente hemos escuchado sobre las peleas en las escuelas y como padres no queremos ver estos problemas escalar. En enero, la señora Criste hizo una presentación sobre el trabajo actual del MTSS del Distrito Desarrollar, un sistema de apoyo multinivel. On another note, our DLAC board and families continue to share concerns regarding behavior in schools. This topic is very important for parents to know about. Lately, we have heard about fights happening at schools and as parents, we don't want to see these problems escalate. In January, Ms. Christie presented on the current MTSS work of the district building positive behavior systems. Todavía nos gustaría recibir un informe de servicios estudiantiles sobre los nuevos datos de la disciplina en en Riverside y compartir con nuestros padres del Código de Educación relacionado con el debido proceso, las suspensiones y las expulsiones. Trabajaremos juntos en el futuro para garantizar que nuestras familias estén completes, completamente informadas. We would still like to receive an update from Pupil Services about discipline data in RUSD and share with our parents the education code related to due process, suspensions, and expulsions. We will work close together moving forward to ensure our families are fully informed. Necesitamos talleres productivos que ayuden a nuestros padres aún más a tener bases para ayudar a nuestros hijos, tener una conexión profunda con ellos y así obtener resultados efectivos. Queremos hacer la diferencia de ser padres responsables y no tener hijos indomables. We need productive workshops that help our parents even more to have the basics to help our children have a deeper connection with our children and thus achieve effective results. We want to make a difference, be responsible parents, and have well-behaved children. Y por último, continuamos invitándolos a tener nuestras reuniones de DILA, que siempre son el último miércoles de cada mes. Además, queremos pedirles a los directores de nuestra escuela que sigan asistiendo a nuestras reuniones. Se agradece su apoyo. Muchas gracias, la Junta Directiva de DILA. Gracias. Lastly, we continue to invite you to our DLAC meetings that are always on the last Wednesday of every month. Additionally, we request that our school principals keep attending our meetings. We appreciate your support. Thank you, the DLAC Executive Board. Thank you. No, ninguna. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, th that was a very thoughtful report, and all of your input is uh, appreciated and acknowledged. Our next uh, representative is Ms. Alicia Ricks, who is the president of the Special Education Community Advisory Committee. Welcome, Ms. Ricks. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, President Farouk, and board members. Ms. Ricks, if you could just raise it just a little Thank bit. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you tonight in regards to the CAC. I would also like to say how much I appreciate the opportunity of being a parent leader. The Poly Life Skills Room is coming along. We have paint, cabinets are going to be installed, um, and we do have an oven. 
so that was um, a big win for us was the oven, which was much needed. Um, the electrical issue was taken care of, and we are so thankful for Mr. Hansen and the board for helping achieve a much needed space to grow our students' abilities. We have been able to grow a parent involvement during the monthly meetings, which has been a challenge in the past. We've incorporated Zoom with in-person, and Mr. Hansen has also given us um, his, the use of one of his rooms at Poly. Um, so that makes it um, extremely accessible to the families that can't come out in person, but it also gives the ability for parents that can, and we do offer daycare um, so they can bring their kids. We have been able to grow the meetings with the robocalls, and we've also been able to, we've gotten on the emails as well, so that's helped. Um, also, we've had a lot of great speakers, so that's also bringing our parents back. Mr. Hansen is always at our meetings, so he always comes in. Um, we do have some um, issues sometimes getting Zoom on, so he always helps with that. Um, so that's greatly appreciated. We are also providing our families with new resources in regards to financial planning. Um, that include our Cal Able accounts, special needs trust, and conservatorships. And as always, Jessica Shields always makes an appearance with her smiling face in regards to social emotional needs for all of our families. And we are always grateful for her partnership. We are working on how we can improve our meetings for next year. We will be we will be revisiting movie night at Poly, and we are working on getting an advocate to join us in regards to. Um, Social Security, the ins and outs, and also for in-home supportive services. And I am looking for another productive year, and thank you for your continued support. And I just wanted to say how grateful I am to Mrs. Frosto and Mrs. Wood, because without them, like we wouldn't be able to um, have these meetings. They're always there. It, it doesn't matter what time of night it is, if I need something or if I have a question, they're always there for me. So I just wanted to say thank you to them. They're doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ricks. We appreciate that report and the progress. Our last, uh, certainly not least, uh, report is from Ms. Jessica Shields, the president of the District African American Parent Advisory Committee. Good evening, board president Baruch, board members, superintendent Hill, and the community. I am so honored to report out on behalf of DAPAC. So this year marks 10 years that the district has put a focus on African-American achievement in regards to A through G completion with the creation of the Heritage Program. And our most recent graduating class, class of 2022, had a 55% A through G completion rate and that is a growth of over 10% since the program's inception. The DAPAC board and its members are just really looking forward to a great celebration this year on May 3rd at JW North High School. So you all are invited to come and honor our graduates at the Heritage Graduation Celebration. And with the focus now extending to our ninth graders, we anticipate a very positive impact on Black student achievement. So a few new things that we're trying out. Uh, this summer, DAPAC plans to continue to meet to ramp up Black family engagement within the RUSD community. And we also want to engage our supporters, our community members that may not necessarily be a part of the district. So just really a family feel. And we have formed a committee to plan our very first engagement in event, and we're calling it Black Family Reunion. Now, after much discussion, we are planning to host this event in partnership with the district and other community entities just in time for back to school. So we're looking at August. And our vision really is to have an event that gives those old school family reunion vibes with sack races, games, entertainment, and just a fun time to get together. And we also have a vision to give away school supplies, backpacks, and more. So we're supporting our families that way. So just be on the lookout for more to come and how you can help promote and uh, just support the wonderful event that we have planned. And so everybody is invited. Also, we do plan to continue 
uh, to have discussions around Black student achievement for next school year. And we really want to have more of those close-knit conversations with you, our school leaders, our board members, because we wanna work closer in how we can address some of the sentiments that Black students and Black families have surrounding the sense of belonging in our USD schools. And we are also very anxiously waiting and anticipating those state results, the state testing results, so that we can use data to help drive some decisions about exactly what we need in order to move that dial in preparing more Black students, especially in the areas of math, science, technology, and engineering. And that's compared to what we see in the data historical data from other racial groups were really the furthest behind since even before I started grade school. So decades. Um, and we want to focus on closing those achievement gaps. And the only way that we can do this is number one, if we're working together, but also understanding that we need to strengthen the connection between brain-based learning and rigorous culturally responsive teaching. So we really look forward to getting together, making things happen, changing it up so that we can finally see a difference in what the data has been saying historically for decades. Thank you again for your continued support and have a good evening. Thank you to Ms. Shields uh, for that thoughtful input and uh, leadership on all your regards on these issues. Our next item is uh, District Superintendent comments, so I will turn it over to Superintendent Hill. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. As the student representative said, we're wrapping up the school year quickly. Um, and so we're in the season of uh, events and, and award sessions. My site visits continue. Since we last met, I was able to visit the Education Options Center that Michaela talked about earlier today, Sierra Middle School, the Adult School, Woodcrest Elementary, Rivera High Grove, and Magnolia Elementaries. I saw many great examples of hard work there. I want to take a few minutes to discuss some concerns that have been taking place on our campuses this week. First, about Martin Luther King High School. A video depicting an altercation involving students at Martin Luther King High School has been widely circulated on social media this week. This matter has the full attention of Riverside Unified School District Administration and is being addressed expeditiously. Since the incident occurred, district staff has been working to ensure the safety and rights of all students that they are considered and are promptly responded to. We are able to verify that the student will no longer be attending King High School. We encourage those who have taken interest in this story We encourage those who have taken interest in this story to respect the confidential nature of our specific discussions with those involved and the efforts we will continue to make to ensure we provide the appropriate learning environment for each student as required by law. Secondly, at Ramona, I will share a portion of the post by our partners at Riverside Police Department. Our school resource officer assisted school staff with some student unrest near the end of lunch break, and the school was put into lockout. One student refused to adhere to the directions of a school administrator and the school resource officer, resisted attempts by the SRO to detain him, so he was later booked into jail for resisting arrest. All other rumors are not true. Rumors of stabbing and other things that were posted are untrue. I want to emphasize that the safe, that student and staff safety and well-being is a top priority for the board and in the district. We respond to each event. We have and we will increase the number of campus supervisors, not only to provide additional caring adults on campus, but to support a safe environment. We have added staff, we have added strategies, and will continue to do so. 
Finally, I would like to express a personal desire for us all to work collaboratively towards situations that keep each and every student safe on campus. We have diverse schools and are responsible to embrace every single child and all the assets they bring to the campus. A portion of the Our Riverside uh, Police Department post asked parents to remind students of the importance of continuing to make positive choices during the rest of the school year. That opinion I support, but it also extends to all of us, parents, staff, and community members in our roles as adults to practice civil discourse here, at our schools, and on social media. In this way, we can achieve our common goal of having safe and supportive schools. Thank you, Dr. Furu. Thank you for that, uh, that comprehensive report. And in the spirit of what Superintendent Hill said as a transition to the next item of public input, I just really want to uh, emphasize the importance of that uh, civic discourse and to show respect uh, uh, to all of us here in the community. At this time, members of the public may provide comments on any items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. The board is limited to responses they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet we are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to a presenter's public comments. Also, I would like to note that public comments submitted via the electronic communication submission form for this meeting have been provided to the board and have also been attached to the agenda for this meeting. I turn to our clerk, uh, Trustee Tom Hunt. Turn your mic off. One moment. Okay, thank you, Trustee Hunt, uh, for sharing all this information. Uh, so I will read off a few uh, speakers at once just so people can prepare. Uh, we'll start with Maria Hernandez speaking on employee duties services, followed by Shirley Tribble, followed by Rocio Mejia. Is Maria Hernandez here? Welcome, Ms. Hernandez. You have three minutes. Good evening, board members. Good evening, board members, cabinet, uh, and superintendent. Uh, if you please allow me, I'm going to pass uh, some handouts to the board. Uh, Speak, please try to speak into them. Yes. This is not the first time that I'm here. I've, uh, the first time that I came here was uh, when I was trying to uh, reclassify my position. And back then, I didn't give you a handout that has a couple of pages. I gave you a binder. Uh, it came down to uh, those couple of pages. Uh, I, after that, I submitted my reclassification twice. The three times it was denied. Uh, if you look at uh, the package that I just um, gave you, the first one is a, a request to uh, grant me a position that reflect what I do in the two schools that I work with. And the uh, special education local 
public agency, Riverside Department. And uh, much of what I do is for SELPA, the SELPA Department, Special Education Public, Local Public Agency. Uh, I serve uh, Riverside Unified SELPA, Riverside Unified the District, Fremont Elementary School, and Jefferson Elementary School. Jefferson Elementary School has uh, close to 1,000 students right now. Uh, a big number of these, a big percent of these, is uh, a Hispanic, uh, of Hispanic origin. And uh, my title is translator, Ranch 17. Uh, there are two, uh, two different positions for translators. One, uh, the other is district translator interpreter. Mine is only translator. If you look at the packet, like I said, my request, my request was to grant me a position that uh, accurately reflects what I do in the schools. The first attachment, A1, has the description of my position, and I'm going to uh, read the representative duties. Perform non-technical translations, including translation of meeting notices, minutes, parent conferences, brochure, policies, booklets, letters, or other translation of general or routine nature. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Your, your time is up. Thank you. We'll have the information that you shared. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, thank you. Your time is up. You will review the information you shared. Uh, we have our next speaker, Shirley Tribble. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so, uh, Miss Ibarra will follow up with you. Uh, please, your, your time is up. We'll, we'll follow up with you. Our next speaker is Shirley Tribble, followed by Rocio Mejia, followed by Marcella Frias. Welcome, Ms. Tribble. You have three minutes. President and Superintendent Hill and board members, hello, how are you? See, there's some changes. Okay, first of all, um, Mr. Martin, someone? Uh, I think I requested it before, but I'm going to request it again. I would like a final report of the completion for King and Polly construction, including what was done and completed and the cost. And um, with the construction, uh, with the final planning for North and for Casablanca, I wanted to know which construction company has been uh, chosen bid for those two areas. Because uh, I know that we had the meeting with the union and everything, but as I discussed before, the union is gonna cost more. I saw on here that uh, for one of the, for North, one of the bids were the uh, DCL construction, and that is a different one uh, that I see that you're going to be using that was bid for at a lower cost. And the other uh, question is, is, are they going to be under the same construction management that you used for all the other high school, I mean, for Polly and King and all the other construction? Remember, they were all under one big management and then the other uh, construction workers were under them. Is that going to be the same thing for Poly and Casablanca Elementary School? Anybody know? And are you going to be using the same construction company that's going to be using the kids that have gone through the pathway programs? Do you guys know that? Because you made a, you've made bids for the construction for, I saw, for North. Yes. So are you going to be using those same construction companies or are you going to be do, using different construction companies? This topic is not on the agenda. Our staff can follow up with you, but we can't respond. Okay, because, uh, you know, we want to make sure that, the, that North and Casablanca schools, which the planning have already been completed, get construction companies at the lower bids. We do not want to go with the union for those two plans that have been completed because it's going to cost us too much money. 
and Casablanca and North plans have already been completed. So we want to stay with a construction company that's not going to cost us more money. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Treble. Our next speakers are Rocio Mejia and Marcela Frias, followed by We'll, I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. Good evening, board members. My name is Rocio Mejia. My job here as a parent, I'm here as a parent representing my child and other children who, um, who at this point um, of us coming out of a very difficult time, obviously, and we have actually, uh, I know you guys are addressing the issues with discipline and stuff, but my child has actually my child, my five-year-old, um, I also have a 27-year-old graduate, so I've been around RUSD for quite a, a bit. So anyways, my point is um, I actually have a child who's just started her RUSD journey, and she's been spit on, she's been kicked, she's had her skirt pulled down, she's had, um, she actually just had a staff member take away her food and share with the staff member that she is still hungry. So if you guys can please tell me where this is appropriate, we definitely need more training. My child shared with the staff member that she was still hungry. It's totally inappropriate. Um, just saw my child's face and I was confused myself because I'm standing right there with you as a staff member who my child trusts and I trust the staff member to take care of my child. So um, with all these issues being addressed, I actually had the student who punched my child, my daughter has ptosis, um, which is a nerve condition. The student who actually punched my student after surgery in her eye was put in the same classroom as my student, which I actually, at the beginning of the year, addressed it and shared my concern. So the student is still actually physically physical with the students. Um, I did actually try to contact Ms. Hill at some point. I did receive a, a letter from, from your office, but I was never able to talk to you. Um, I did actually try to speak to uh, David Marshall, and he actually said, this student has the same rights as my child. Actually, I, I completely agree with you, but not at the expense of my child's safety because their safety is number one priority. And I do believe that there is uh, somewhat of a gap in that because um, we're coming out of a very difficult time. I've had all the patients in the world. My child has been in um, RUSD for two years. It's very early in her journey and I'm very concerned for my child's safety and um, I don't know how to tell you that I had to peel her off of me one day and put her in the school where I am confused as well myself. And it makes me sad for the parents who can't speak up for themselves. So I'm here on behalf of the parents that are having a very difficult time as, as myself. Thank you, Ms. Mejia. We, we, we will have our staff follow up with you. The next three speakers are uh, Marcella Frias, Daniel Luther, and Dave Everett. Welcome, Ms. Frias. Good evening, uh, President Farouk, mm -hmm. Dr. Hill, yeah. and members of the board. I'm here today to uh, thank Ms. Hill personally for uh, shadowing me at Jackson. Her visit was great. A great one. She was on an amazing head custodian as she made my job easy just with her presence. Everything was clean when she arrived. Um, Brene, I hope uh, your shadowing uh, gave you a clear understanding of what we do as head custodians in the morning. I just came up to uh, bring some stuff to your attention here. Uh, us head custodians, it's very hard in the morning. We have to make sure our campus is stay, uh, safe. We have a lot of homeless at our campuses and we gotta make sure that it's secure and uh, everything's in working order for our staff, which teachers, uh, students, and the rest of the uh, staff members. Um, our campus has been remodeled and uh, it's like 
we take two steps forward, but then we have to take two steps back because something happens with the remodelization, whether it's the plumbing, the something happens. And um, our principal has worked really hard to beautify our campus. She's done so many amazing things to our campus. Uh, the painting, uh, classrooms getting new furniture. And I'm here uh, to ask, is there any way we can get help uh, with funding for a new container and new cafeteria tables. She has beautified our campus and spend money to make our staff happy, our kids happy. Everybody's happy. They're getting new furniture, old furniture that we've had for a long time. And um, I'm here to ask if uh, you guys can somehow help us get cafeteria tables and a container for our items in the NPR. And I'm also here, 55, 54 seconds. I'm also here to address ELOP. Uh, the ELOP uh, really needs, it needs help in that, that area needs help. Uh, the custodians they're hiring and they're bringing for four hours don't know a lot about how to be a custodian, how to clean a school, how to properly clean a restroom, how to uh, build desk. Is there a program that maybe we can start? I mean, I'm willing to volunteer to teach these four-hour custodians how to properly clean a school. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to my water fountains, our restrooms. I want them to clean them like I clean them. So with that said, I'm hoping that maybe we can come up with an idea to help the ELOP, if possible. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you, Ms. Frias. Thank you. Our next two Our next two speakers are Daniel Luther and Dave Everett. Welcome, Mr. Luther. You have three minutes. I'm out of Mr. Everett. Out of the other speaker is here. I'm happy oh, to let him go first. Is Daniel Luther here? Okay, uh, please proceed, Mr. Everett, Dave Everett. All right, um, thanks. I, I'm here to, again to talk about the uh, discriminatory uh, community benefits, so-called community benefits agreement that's really just a special interest deal for the unions. And um, when uh, one of the other previous speakers was talking about the, uh, the other projects at North, uh, those, as far as I know, will be under the project labor agreement. Those will be union projects. Those will be at higher costs, and so they will get you know, four buildings for the price of five. So, um, and I think something that I think we've tried to show, and, and I don't know that we've done a great job of this, but 87% um, of the construction statewide workforce chooses to be union free. So you're getting rid of 87% of your workforce. If you got, 80, got rid of 87% of the restaurants in the city, the remaining 13% would go up in price. That's what's gonna happen to your bids. It's going to reduce competition, and it's going to explicitly discriminate against uh, the folks I represent at the Western Electrical Contractors Association, as far as, and also uh, the young men in the uh, AGC program, the ABC program. All those are located here in Riverside. Uh, it's also uh, going to discriminate against the only state-certified black, excuse me, <clears throat> black apprenticeship program in California, the Black Contractors Association. They oppose PLAs. Their apprentices, nor any apprentices in any union-free program, will be allowed to be used under this PLA period. Even those that uh, are learning here in Riverside and who attended Riverside Unified School District uh, schools. Do you support discrimination based on group affiliation? Because this is what this PLA does. There's specific sections I had questions about as well. In section 3.81, Non-union contractors are only allowed to use five of their employees. Five employees? How is that fair to your local contractors, to 87% of your local contractors? Section 3.11, the few non-union employees who are allowed uh, to be used, they have to pay union dues. They don't get a vote in the union. They don't get representation in the union. So why is that wage theft okay with you guys? Section 5.2, the non-union employees who are used must have their benefits pay sent to the union trust funds. Uh, those workers will not vest and they will, that money will be lost to them. So again, it's wage theft for their benefits and for their retirement plans. So uh, I'm not sure why that's okay several times over for this school district board. But last but not least, I would point out that 98% of black and Latino construction companies in the state, in the country, in Riverside County are non-union. 
you're going to discriminate against 98% of black and Latino construction workers with this project labor agreement. Um, I, I would strongly urge you to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of uh, areas where there's uh, a cluster of people on, on two particular topics. Um, the first one is Castleview. It's within the 20 minute total. So we'll just proceed with this. It's uh, starting with Gracie Torres, followed by Mark Keene, followed by Dr. Brian Keene. Is Gracie Torres here? Okay. Well, uh, as soon as they can come over, but we'll, is Mark Keene here, Dr. Mark Keene? Okay, if they can come over. Dr. Brian Keene? Okay, welcome, Dr. Keene, you have three minutes. Buenas noches, Superintendente Hill, Presidente Farouk, estimados miembros del board, thank you for being here. I'm terrified to speak before you, but I'm grateful that, Dr. Hill, or that uh, Superintendent Hill, you began by saying that we need to work collaboratively for the safety of every child. Thank you for stating that. The lives of our queer and trans, non-binary, intersex students are on the line at the moment. As an educator couple, my husband and I spend a lot of time researching student and school success, and we know that the School Board of California just published a study a few days ago about, in, it was a peer-reviewed study, about the K-12 teacher and administrator turnover, citing student and parent violence and harassment as key causes, even at a moment when we can see the silver lining that there are a number of young people surging to become teachers so that the future generations can see themselves reflected in the schools. I'm grateful grateful that a number of LGBTQIA2 plus individuals are part of those young folk that will be part of our teachers and administrators. We wanted to address a letter that was sent to the board and that you're aware of and that we've... Uh, be full. Please don't do that. Thank you. We wanted to address a, a defamatory letter that was already sent to the board and to evoke a statement that Mr. Hunt made at the last board meeting, which is that information is the best form of defense against ignorance. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. As parents, we'd like to call you to continue to provide resources across the website for training and for parent education. As we're approaching Pride Month, we know that there is a lot more that RUSD can do to ensure the safety of LGBTQIA staff and students and teachers as well. We've provided such resources to the district from Sacramento to San Diego, and we know that conversations are being had, so I'm grateful to all of you for that. I wanted to also just address the libelous letter that you've received about a teacher in our district, about a Latina leader, and to quote novelist Toni Morrison, who says, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. We don't have time to be distracted. You don't have time to be distracted by the hate that is happening in our city, in our region. And so we call this letter what it is, a racist attack towards a Latina leader in our community, someone who has made our school safe for indigenous students, for black, Asian American, and Latinx students, for any number of individuals of the LGBTQIA community. Our advocacy work confirms that every accusation that you'll hear tonight against our community is in fact a confession of the rhetoric that is used against marginalized groups. So we reject the defamatory letter. We ask you to not be distracted by transphobic language tonight. We are appreciative of all the support you continue to give. We want us to support the leaders in our community and to know that you are all doing great work and I hope that you can have a smile and a positive moment despite some really hateful rhetoric outside these doors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keen. I just want to remind everyone to please be respectful of everyone while they're speaking. Uh, is, uh, uh, Gracie Torres, I see, is here. Uh, if Dr. Mark Keen. Okay, Mark, Dr. Mark Keen is not here. Uh, after Gracie Torres, will, will be followed by Sarah Russell and Sarah Brooks. Welcome, Ms. Torres. Chairman, board members, I just first I want to say it's so good to see you here. Uh, board member Kinnear. I'm, I'm happy that you're all here. Um, my, my name is Gracie Torres. I am here to just really um, send a, a, a positive thank you to um, my child's principal. Um, we've had 
uh, wonderful year. Uh, my, my, my little one, um, as a parent, we all know um, how nervous we get when we drop them off. Uh, she's the baby of our household, a premature baby who um, I, you know, I hold very dearly and tightly. Even her older siblings, were, when they moved out of elementary school, we were all nervous. But um, the principle that she has now um, has made her feel welcome, included, seen, and protected. And so that, that's what we want. In all my years um, as a mother of our USD students, this is the first time I can say that our family has been heard, seen, and taken care of. And I, I directly attribute that to the leadership that is, is at, at that school. Um, today, I, I urge you to, to you know, um, share that sense of gratefulness that, that I share with, with your administrators. They work day in and day out to make sure that our kids are safe in a very, very tough time, coming out of a very even worse time. So that, that's really what I want to share is that our, our, our kids are safe and I'm grateful, grateful with all my heart that my kids are, are safe and especially my baby. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Torres. Before you go, there's a, Ms. Torres. Ms. Torres. I have a clarifying a, question. There's two clarifying questions. Ms. Torres, what, uh, what school are, are your students at and what uh, principal are you referring to? Oh, my, uh, my baby goes to Castleview Elementary and I'm speaking of Rosalva Rodriguez. Trustee Hunt, did, is there something you wanted to? Okay, thank you. Our next two speakers are Sarah Russell and Sarah Brooks. Welcome, Ms. Russell. You have three minutes. Good evening to you all. Um, my, name's, my name is Sarah Russell. I've been a teacher with RUSD for nine years, eight of which I've spent at Castleview Elementary School. I'm here because there's word of a petition going around to get rid of our principal, Rosalba Rodriguez. Um, I was under the impression that that could be spoke of tonight. I speak with the support of much of our staff and school at my school site of our principal. It would be detrimental to lose her at this point in time. She's been a fierce leader in combating the many challenges at our school site with unique circumstances. She is made leaps and bounds in forming relationships with students, parents, and staff. I'm a member of our school's MTSS team. Um, we've learned and implemented so much up to this point. It would be unfortunate to have to backtrack on all of that hard work uh, with a new leader. I hope that you can take into consideration the impact of this decision will have on our staff and most importantly, our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Our next speaker is Sarah Brooks. Welcome, Ms. Brooks. You have three minutes. Good evening, board members. Um, I am Sarah Buster Brooks. I am a parent of a child at Castleview Elementary School, and I am here to voice uh, resoundedly my support of Principal Rosalba Rodriguez. Um, I am a child of an educator. I quite literally grew up on elementary school campuses, and I am a former RUSD student myself. And there's one thing that I know from my own experience as a child of educators, and like I said, literally growing up on elementary school campuses, is that an elementary school is not simply the place where our children go every day. It is a place for the whole family. And Mrs. Rodriguez has made this school a safe and welcoming place for all children and all families. And whatever silly petition is out there, I hope you completely disregard it because we need more Mrs. Rodriguez's in our USD. And quite frankly, we need more in the, in the elementary school level to promote the type of nurturing and safe environments for not only families, but also children to learn, grow, and explore. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. So, we have uh, a number of cards regarding the King High School 
incident, uh, exceeding the, the 20 minutes that we typically allocate for topics. Uh, at direction from my colleagues, we, will, we have an option of, uh, of capping the overall uh, discussion on this issue for 20 minutes. Uh, I defer to all of you if there's any consensus or thoughts. Trustee Hunt. Yes, our, our protocols and uh, based on the Brown Act, if there are, if whatever your time limit, ours is three, sometimes we've dropped to the two, but if uh, there are a plethora of cards, and for us it would be seven, which would be 21 minutes, uh, we ask the, give them time, but we ask the speakers to get together and kind of decide what their course will be. Sure. <clears throat> so if we could put uh, 20 minutes on the clock, and so a, a few things just to keep in and it's it's not a it's it's not a running 20 minutes you need to uh, okay I, all right i'm sorry please please be respectful it, yeah. it's not a running clock because you have, people have to come up right. and back so the folks in the back would stop it when one correct and going from there okay so uh i i hope uh our, our staff in the back heard that. So as, as uh, speakers are finished with their time, if we could stop the clock while we, we transition to, from speaker to speaker. Uh, I just really want to reiterate again uh, what we shared uh, in the beginning, to please be respectful uh, and m monitor the civic discourse of this environment and this topic. Please, 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 okay, please, please be respectful. Okay, okay, all right, okay, if this, if, if, if our meeting is disrupted, we will have to call a recess. So please uh, allow us to conduct our business. Does Dr. Hernandez Alexander, are you wanting to propose something? Please, please allow Dr. Hernandez Alexander to speak. We're conducting a, a meeting. Dr. Hernandez Alexander, what would you like to say? I would like to propose that we, um, we offer the same courtesy that we did the last time we had a, a large engagement mm -hmm. of the public, and we limited comment to two minutes. Okay. Um, we've, I, I know that it's a lot, I know that it's a lot, but it, there's a great concern and we they're here and okay does do, does do any of my colleagues concur with that the two minute option i mean i i, I want to do whatever is whatever we've done before when we've had a, a large um interest in the public and what we've done in the past is we've limited the time per speaker Correct. please so that everybody has an opportunity to speak okay please allow us to conduct our business uh, Trustee yes, Hunt. Uh, Dr. Farouk, Dr. Farouk the, uh, the Brown Act does allow either for the 20-minute combination or for the board to set the time, right. whatever it may be. So, so right. That, so, so Dr. Hernandez Alexander is proposing the two-minute and how many, how many? Yes, ma'am. And Martin two-minute per High person School so that everybody her, has an right. opportunity to speak. Her trustee. Trustee Kinnear. I'd like to know how many cards we have. How many speakers do we have? Are we talking? One, two, yeah, three, four, five. There's, there's, but there's, but okay. Please allow us to to speak. Otherwise, we will have to call. Okay. Okay. We, okay. Please allow us to conduct our business. Otherwise, we will have to call a, a recess. Trustee Kinnear, we have between eight to eleven cards. It's unclear on some of the, the other ones what their topic is. Then. Uh, yeah, if we have a two. Okay, please allow Trustee Kinnear to speak. If we have uh, eight to, uh, to 11 cards, we should listen to all the speakers. And. I, well, Naomi overrode me. So. No, no, I'm 
Chicago. And it has been common practice in all the meetings that I've been a part of that when there are large numbers that we limit the, co the, the comments to two minutes, but we listen to everybody. Sure. That's what I propose to do. Sure. Okay, so. I, I agree, we, I agree with have, Mr. Kinnear. So we have consensus with the board to have uh, two minutes for every speaker. Uh, so we will start with uh, Megan Simpkins, followed by Joey Cervantes, followed by Lori Lopez. Welcome, Megan, you have two minutes. and gentlemen it is okay, and shall one moment oh. let's get the let's make sure the mic is on also one second hello okay oh wait, wait yeah okay please proceed okay. thank you hello ladies and gentlemen and only ladies and gentlemen it is and shall always be I am an 18 year old high school student and wanted to take this time to bring to your attention the current issue with biological men claiming they are women and in turn truly believing that they are entitled to use women's spaces. There was an incident within our district that occurred recently regarding a transgender woman who really is a bio biological man having an altercation with a young woman at MLK High School. It was infuriating when I had seen the video on social media, but what was detrimental to this is the fact that this man is and has been using the women's restroom and locker room. Firstly, the question we must address is why are we affirming the mental confusion of this boy and putting the safety of women in jeopardy by allowing mentally confused men to use the women's spaces? Of course, any male who claims he is a woman will accept it, but what about the women? What about the true girls like myself who are female down to our DNA? Why don't we ever get a say in whether or not we are comfortable with this? The truth is we aren't. The majority of us aren't, and yet nothing has been done to protect the safety of these women. I will conclude with this. It all starts with you. You are in charge of the safety of us women and, our, and, the, parent, and the kids of our parents. So, so please do something about it. Thank you. Our, our next speakers are Joey Cervantes, followed by Lori Lopez, followed by Glenn Hunter. Is Mr. Cervantes? Okay. Welcome, Mr. Cervantes, you have two minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm here today because of King High School, the things that are going on with these students that call themselves females that are built like men, that are actually men. Um, if anything happens with my daughter from these, I don't understand. I've been in my daughter's life for a whole 16 years and you know, single father or single parent, you know? So if anything happens with my daughter and the people to, in the uniforms come after me because I take care of a guy, now I'm in jail because of the bad things you guys allow happen. That's not cool at all. So now what happens with my daughter? It's just, it's unacceptable. Uh, put yourself in the same situation. Would you guys want your daughters getting the beat, you know, they're beat down by a guy? Uh, then what would you guys do? How would you guys act? Um, I don't know if we're just drawing pictures and doodling over here or what's going on, but do, if I'm being heard, does anything go down in the books to make shit happen? Or is it just listen and that's it, carry on next? That's, what's the next procedure after this? Question, I'm asking. This agenda is not on the, top, uh, on the agenda, so we can't comment to it, but our superintendent did issue a statement prior to the comments. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't understand how, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, as far as, I don't know, chicks with dicks, everything, it's not cool, you know, I mean, but it's got, you gotta draw the line somewhere, you know? It's just, it really has to happen. That way things could be normal again. Everybody go back to normal and just be straight, be right, and that's it. Um, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it. I don't know if you guys listen, if you guys actually take matters and think about it at night. Do you guys have loved ones too? You know, it, it's kinda, that's how it goes. My opinion, 100%. Um, I don't know. I just hope nothing happens to my daughter, for reals. Um, yeah, feel, feel bad, you know, but. I guess, see how it goes. Thanks for your time. Our next speakers are Lori Lopez, Glenn Hunter, and Mariah Borges. Welcome, Ms. Lopez, you have two minutes. Um, I'm here again to talk about safety at King High School. This is the fourth time I've been to this meeting to talk about safety on school campuses. Um, the circumstances of these altercations remain truly unknown to most, but what is known is there has been an increase in violence on school campuses and that this biological male student who has now been involved in three to four altercations with females likely needs a level of mental health care that the school counselors are unable to provide. 
I am glad to see that this student is no longer on campus. The question is why didn't the district act sooner to protect girls? Does the news media and big accounts on social media need to be involved before the district does the right thing? This issue specifically is just one small piece in a giant puzzle of bad policies that have led to the deterioration on campuses. I refuse to believe that there isn't more that this district can do to make campuses safer. I refuse to accept that this is 100% blame on the state of California. And as a mom, I want to know what specific measures are being put in place to assure safety. I want to know that when students, whether they're males or females, when they repeatedly engage in violent acts, what is the threshold to remove them from campus? <clears throat> when is enough enough? You had classified staff thrown to the ground, tackling somebody, putting their body physically in the way to protect a female student. It's just, it's mind boggling. Um, lastly, it baffles me that as a concerned mom who spoke out about this same issue last time, the last meeting, I was referred to as transphobic and accused of misgendering this student. I would like to say that because you and I disagree on ideology, it does not make me transphobic because I speak up on behalf of girls. Uh, this is just misguided, and I'm going to tell you that I've had enough of this. There's no reason that my 14-year-old daughter has less rights today than I had when I was a child. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to say for the audience to please make sure that we don't interrupt the meeting or the speakers, uh, and we want to make sure the meeting proceeds without disruption. This is a, this is a, a warning. Uh, and we would have to uh, ask disruptors to leave uh, if that, that perpetuates. Our next speakers are Glenn Hunter, followed by Mariah Borquez, followed by Kristen Zastro. Welcome, Mr. Hunter. Good evening, esteemed board members and officials. My name is Glenn W. Hunter of the Black Student Advocate, and their phone number is 833-925-1957. Again, it's 833-925-1957. The website where you can find us is the Black Student Advocate, continuous stream of characters, dot com. We're a media company that stops the preschool to prison pipeline by advocating for black students and black employees against K through 12 school districts. The Black Student Advocate assists families with getting the services they need and holds school districts accountable. Board, we have a problem. And the problem is the continued racism and discrimination within Riverside USD. We're advocating for a student right now who for a couple of years has been verbally, physically, mentally, and recently sexually assaulted while attending Mountain View Elementary School. She has been harassed, intimidated, and bullied because of her natural hairstyle. Your policy, 5145.3, non-discrimination harassment, original adopted date, June 16, 2020 and last revived, reviewed, 6 16 is a joke and is not being enforced by Mountain View Elementary School administration and staff. <laughs> Riverside USD is charged and served notice that you are in violation of the following Black Student Advocate Ed Codes, 48900 48900 ABC and D, because of the failure to act providing a familiar, a safe environment for students, for students to learn. What we have here, according to education in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, if I may remind you, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 64 protects people from discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in programs or activities that receive federal financial They, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Our next speakers are Mariah Borges, followed by Kristen Zastro, followed by Sal Flores. Welcome, Ms. Borges. You have two minutes. Hello and good evening, uh, members of the board. I am a concerned parent. Um, my daughter is one of the girls there at Mar Martin Luther King Jr. that has been bullied by this male that is causing chaos. Bullying these girls and putting them through things that shouldn't, this school should have kept them safe. And I feel like Martin Luther King staff failed to do that to keep our girls safe. 
And I also want to address that the women's space as well. I don't believe that a male identifying as a female should be allowed in the women's restroom or the lockers room as well. If you have male body parts, you could, you're still considered as a male, no matter what mentally you're thinking. So I also want to address as well, of one of the other students' um, um, parents said that it took so long for the school to act on so many occasions. There were so many incidents prior to this incident happening. And like the, another parent has said prior to me, what does it have to take? Does it have to take a tragic, serious, severe injury or a death in our schools? Who's to blame for then if something like that were to take place? You guys would be to blame for an incident like that because you guys chose not to take this incident seriously when things were already brought to the school's attention. I just feel like you guys need to step up your game and add more security and do things the right way. And like they say, male is a male and female is a female. We should all be in our own spaces. Thank you. Our next speakers are Kristen Zastro, followed by Sal Flores, followed by Gabriel Rebel. Welcome, Ms. Zastro. You have two minutes. Okay, I want to talk about all the fights taking place at King on a weekly basis. Let me ask you a question. How is it that you're responsible for our kids' safety until they get home from school, yet you can't provide a safe environment for the kids at school? You have a tra transgender boy that identifies as a girl beating up on girls at school, and the same boy that is going into the girls' locker room and changing. What about the girls and their rights? Why are we catering to a handful of transgender kids while the straight kids are the ones suffering and paying the price? Make this make sense. It makes no sense. You have campus supervisors that can't do their jobs because they're worried about being fired, and the same as the teachers. What happened to disciplining individuals who are doing wrong? We are the taxpayer paying the salaries of the principals, teachers, etc. As a school board, it is your job to make sure the kids are safe and you are failing terribly. We have Sal Flores, followed by Gabriel Rebel, followed by Melissa Centurier. Welcome, Mr. Flores, you have two minutes. Thank you. How y'all doing? My name is Sal, and I'm a parent of two girls that go to MLK. One is a junior, one is a sophomore. Uh, at the beginning of this year, my daughter, my oldest, was assaulted by this student. Not physically, with putting their hands on them, but there was an attempt to throw a hydro flask at her face. On top of, she was eventually hit in the face with an ice pack, assaulted. Now, the student, or the student involved was told, the way it was handled at school was, stop talking to her, don't look in her direction, call today was also given a three hour after school detention for assaulting somebody with an object. I don't understand how that makes any sense to anybody. If I were to assault somebody as a student, there's an expectation that there's suspension, possible expulsion, and even law enforcement involvement. My daughter was, was given the opportunity, hey, do you wanna press charges? She said no. The reason she said no was because she was afraid of the outcome afraid that this student or her friends or his friends and allies would possibly shame her, go on social media and attack her, or possibly physically attack her, and she was concerned for her younger sister, as was I. I wasn't in the state at the time, so obviously I wasn't able to go down there. I'm very dismayed by this, very dismayed. And at the end of the day, like a lot of people have said, at, if anything happens, it not only falls on the, the staff at MLK, but the buck stops with you guys. So please, take care of this before it becomes an issue, not just with this student, but in the future with others. Thank you. Our next speakers are Gabriel Rebel, followed by Melissa Centurier, followed by Sandy R. Gabriel is not here? 
Okay. Uh, we'll go to Melissa Centurior, followed by Sandy R, followed by Leticia Pepper. Hi, good evening. Welcome. You have two minutes. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm here also for the same issue. Thank you. I'm here also for the same issue of safety, um, not just for our female students, but also our male students. Um, we're having the same issue as far as boys' bathrooms, with females entering the boys' bathroom. Um, I have a son that goes to Earhart Middle School. There are urinals that are open to the public. Well, clearly the public, because girls are able to go into those bathrooms nowadays. And um, my son, at one point, had said something to a female that was in a boy's bathroom. Later that day, was assaulted by three individuals, uh, two that were binary and one that was transgender. My son was suspended for three days for not hitting back. Um, the other three remained at the school and were prouding around. Nothing had happened to them until I finally was able to meet with the principal and I brought the student, the school resource officer with me. Um, we met with the school, the principal, vice principal. They reviewed the videos, which I sent to all of you guys as well at that time. Um, his suspension was reversed and the other individuals actually only went in that Monday, were released from that school that day for suspension and returned the following day. So I feel that all students should be, discipline should be equal for all. And I feel like that this particular group, uh, they just get a little slap on the wrist. What about the rest of our students? Are the rest of the students, boys and girls, also need help? Please look at all individuals, not just a small little section. Discipline should be equal for all. Thank you. Okay, our next speakers are Sandy R, followed by Leticia Pepper, followed by Missy. Welcome, Miss R, you have two minutes. Good evening. So do we have your attention now? Um, I think that's what your, what your message said to us, that we have your full attention. Well, we were here three weeks ago at your last meeting with the same individual and another video. It only had 10,000 views and there were only 10 parents in the room and we didn't have your attention. At that meeting, your student board, mayor who, board member who is conveniently not here tonight went on three minutes um, defending him, how he was the victim, not the aggressor. And of course, she's not here to defend those statements, of course, that she made last board meeting. So now you claim that, oh, this is your full attention. You didn't care three weeks ago. You know, you're sending us a message. Just like you send, when you, when you don't discipline children, you send them a message that there's no consequences for their action. So what you're doing here is you're sending us a message that the only way that we're gonna get action out of you is a million views and hundreds of people in the room. So if that's the message you wanna send us, we're, we're expanding our network to educate the public of what's going on in schools. So if that's what it takes to get your attention, is to fill this room and get you a million views, we can do it because these incidents are happening on all your campuses and you're not doing anything about it. And the fact that you sat here with this huge amount of parents wanting to be heard and wanting, some of them don't even want to speak. They just want to be here to send a message. And yet you're limiting us to two minutes and you let everyone else speak? No, that's not okay. So I encourage all the parents who want to speak and didn't get to speak, expulsions are on the consent agenda and you can have another three minutes to speak about expulsions and hopefully this student is included in those expulsions because this is not okay. You should not be limiting the public's time to speak. And again, you pick and choose who you want to hear. I'm sorry, Castleview, I support the Castleview recall of the principal. Gender neutral Spanish is not something that the community support Okay, thank you, Ms. Otto, for your time. Our next speakers are Leticia Pepper, followed by Missy, followed by Robin Pash. Welcome, Ms. Pepper, you have two minutes. Good evening. I recognize some familiar faces from about three years ago. I've been busy doing other things, helping teachers who are going to be fired because they wouldn't be vaccinated. I helped hundreds of people not be fired. So, so it's... It's nice to be back, and I wanted to specifically thank Mr. Kinnear, 
who threw himself onto the pyre of being on the school board because we asked him, please, to represent our neighborhood. Please come and help us. So I'm really glad to see you. And I know when I see you writing, you're not scribbling. You're taking notes because you take your job very, very seriously. So a hand for Mr. Kinnear. Thank you very much for doing this. So uh, in keeping with what I used to say when I was coming here before, and I think it's still relevant, there is no statute of limitations for the crime of stealing public funds. And those of you who know me from before know who I'm talking to. That's all I'll say right now. So one last thing is this. This student who was having problems, the person, the, the man who was beating up the girls, uh, I would like to bring to your attention the fact that the last number of school shootings have been committed by people who identified themselves as transgender. And now the problem is, the problem is that a lot of these people, they are being given drugs, they are taking hormones, they have problems. And it may not all be their fault, let me tell you. Some of this stuff is chemical. We're we are living in a soup of all these chemicals. You see what happens to these frogs with the runoff water, right? So because this has been going on, I hate to remind you, but you're going to have a problem in the future with this student if the student wants to come back and get any kind of revenge. So you might want to put that on your agenda. How are you going to deal with these problems in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pepper. Our next two speakers are... Missy and Robin Patch. Welcome, Missy. Welcome, Missy. You have two minutes. Uh, good evening, board. I'll get right to it. Um, these most recent attacks that have happened at King High School, it's nothing new, first of all. Just like Sandy said, you guys knew and saw videos from a few weeks ago, but it had been going on long before that. Parents have been complaining to um, admin at King. Nothing's ever done. They even had the nerve, from what I understand, to tell them that that was considered girl-on-girl -girl combat, so there's nothing they could do. Um, but um, these... Acts of violence are literally directly a result of this district's pathetic lack of action in addressing our concerns. You guys hide behind the excuse that you're supposedly following the law. What about the laws and education codes that are there to protect students from being violently and brutally attacked while at school? You clearly did not take our concerns seriously. We've been addressing this issue to the board regarding the potential for violence by allowing biological male students to have access to girls' bathrooms and locker rooms for months. You've been told about other cases throughout the country, including a young female student that was brutally raped in the girls' bathroom by a biological male student that claimed to identify as female. And if you think shifting this kid to another school is gonna solve the problem, it's not, because that's what they tried to do with this other boy, and he did it again. This district has absolutely no excuse for not being adequately prepared for the brutal and violent attacks against the female students that have continued to occur on multiple occasions. It took far too long for you to address the issue. I would like to know what changes are going to be made to prevent any further violence against female students from biological male students on our campuses because I have a daughter um, that attends Poly High School and this entire year she's regularly seen males go in and out of the girls' bathroom. Thank goodness she graduates in a few more weeks. Um, it's gotten so bad that we pulled our son out of our USD, only having been in it one year after being always in private school. It's the best decision we ever made. So parents, pull your kids out of government schools. It's the only way to teach them your morals and keep them safe. Thank you. Our last public comment is Robin Patch. Is Robin here? Okay. That that concludes our public comment then. Did you, did you provide a comment? Okay, I, for some... Okay, we're going to we're going to take a ten minute recess at this time. Who? We're we're we're.
going to call a 10 minute recess now. We will, we will actually 12 minutes. We will readjourn at 8 p.m.
All right, we are calling the meeting back to order at 8.01 p.m. I want to acknowledge that I, um, at, at the dais, did not receive these cards, but there were three cards submitted um, uh, uh, at the appropriate time. So we will hear from them now. Uh, we, if we can have Angel Henderson, Alicia Bullard, and uh, Anala Marquez to be ready to speak. If Angel is ready, we could start with, with her. Is Angel Henderson, Elisha Elis Bullard, and Anali Marquez, are they available to speak? Yeah, please come to the mic. Uh, welcome, Angel. You have, you, are you, you Angel? Okay, welcome, Angel. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, okay. What do, how do I start? I don't know how to start. Um, I just want to say that this is not right. Like, this shouldn't be happening. Um, this isn't right at all. Like, he's been bothering me and my friends continuously after the first fight. He's been posting about us, continuously bothering us, talking bad about us. And we say, leave us alone. Stop bothering us. But he continues to keep doing it. And the school isn't doing anything. I've been reporting him. I've been in the office at least three times a week reporting about him. And nothing is being done. And I don't know what else I can do, but talk to you guys. So um, I'll have a minute left. Yeah. Well, these kids are here today because King is not doing anything. This boy should not be allowed to okay. return. You, I, I'm the mom. I know, but we we have comments from these three specific speakers. Okay, if they, they could, were, they were speak. done. They were done, and they're a minor. Please, please allow Angel to, to finish. She doesn't. She doesn't okay, even know what to say. I'm pushing them up here to say what if, they need to say because okay, King isn't doing anything. Okay. Uh, and my kid is going to go to school on Monday uh, and not be okay, protected because this our, boy is going back. Our staff will follow up with you. We have common cards from these three specific okay, people. My, I have one in there too. Okay. I have one in there too, okay. and they're with me. Okay, which... Uh, and, they, and you're not going to okay. tell me I can't speak when they jumped on my kid. This is these are mine. And there's no way that they're going to go to school on Monday and get jumped on again. I can guarantee okay. you that. So if you don't want to listen any other way, you will listen Monday if he's back at school. Okay. Okay. Alicia Bullard, which which one of you are? Okay. Alicia, please, uh, you can proceed with your go comments. Ahead, I feel like the school should have done something the first time the situation. Uh, please, yes. please reset the time. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. I feel like the school should have done something the first time, the first fight, and it should not have escalated. And Angel and me and my friends have not should, we should not have been harassed by him multiple times. He would follow us to class, post us on social media, text us, have other people text us, put us in group chat. The school needs to kick him out of the school. He should not be allowed to come back. He should not have been able to jump on Angel the second time. And the school were saying that we got suspended because we didn't tell nobody, but Mr. Harris, the vice principal, and another supervisor were following us when it happened. And two other campus supervisors were already at the situation. So where were we going to go get someone when they were already there? Please allow her to speak. Okay, is that, does that conclude your comments? Our next speaker is Anali, am I pronouncing this correct? Anali Marquez? Analia, so my apologies. Please proceed. Uh, you can speak next. I honestly feel. Please proceed, yeah. I feel like this shouldn't have been in a current situation at King High School or it should be like in a current situation in any school district because this is wrong for a male to be hitting on a woman and especially because it's hurting her that is not okay like that's wrong like I get they shouldn't be saying that it's it should be person on person because it is not person on person, it's a male on woman. And I don't get how you can claim that it's that. Please allow the speaker to speak, please. 
Exactly. Okay. I'm sorry, but that is my comment on what she said. Does, does this conclude your comments? Hmm? Does this conclude your comments? What? Are your, no, does, it doesn't. These three girls, these three girls should okay. not go to school okay. on Monday and be scared. Okay. They're done. Walk off. Walk off. Okay. Thank you for your time. They should not go to school scared okay, on Monday. We do, we don't and that's all I'm going to say. I'm waving. I'm going to be respectful. Okay, but let me you. tell you, if my daughter gets hurt at school, okay, if she gets we, hurt at we, school, it's going to be a problem. Okay. Thank you. All right. Our next agenda item is board member comments. We will start with Trustee Brentley. Board member comments. No comments for me this evening. Okay, uh, Dr. Hernandez, Alex, please, okay, please be respectful. Dr. Hernandez, Alexander. I, I, I just want to, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming out tonight. I, um, we hear you, we see you, we understand. Your concerns are not falling on deaf ears. We assure you. Um, as much as we can legally respond to um, all of the incidents, I can assure you that we do. Um, I am uh, looking forward to having more supervisors on campus, which is something that we've uh, provided funding for, so we will see more supervisors on campuses. This is a discussion that is um, uh, not a, a formal proposal as of right now. We it is formal that we will have more supervisors on our campuses. We have funded for that. A conversation beyond that that I would like to discuss and have a more creative solutions going forward is to engage our parents. You know, our parents want to be involved. Let's, be, let's be a part of the solution. Uh, whatever that means. Well, I know what that means. I'm a parent. I'm responsible for the type of student I send out of the house. That's my first responsibility. The other thing is that you know, maybe we could find a way that we can partner with parents to help us in being helpful, being the eyes, the ears, um, um, being watchful, being helpful, being mentors, being available. Uh, there's so many ways that we can be helpful. Um, so I, I, I want to enlist a conversation. I want to engage uh, in solutions. Okay. Please allow uh, or my colleague so, to, to finish making her remarks. We, no, we, I, I, and I hear you. I, I hear you. And I value and I honor that you're here. Yeah, there's... there's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's, there's legal parameters that tie our hands to, the, the, that, to that logistical timing. All right. But uh, that's, not, that's not neither here nor there. I hope that you hear the spirit with which I'm trying to communicate to you is that I hear you two minutes or 50 minutes I hear you and I'm I, I and I'm saying that we hear you and that we are committed to finding creative solutions to this situation um, I'm enlisting us as parents to be a part of the solution as well step one is communicating the problem and we've and parents have done that okay I've, um, I've Dr. Hernandez, Alexander, I just want to say something real quick. I've shared before that if the meeting continues to be interrupted, we have a law enforcement here. Uh, and if the meeting is continued to be disruptive, we will have to ask people to leave. We, we please allow uh, our public input. Set, our public, our public input portion is closed. Please allow my colleague to to speak speak in honor of Dr. Please. I'm going, to, I'm going to yield my time. All I could say is that, uh, that we're committed to, to, to discipline. We're committed to safe restrooms and figuring out a solution for our restrooms at all of our campuses. Um, and, I, and we're committed to safety for all of our students. That's all I can tell you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Trustee Tom Hunt. Thank you, Doctor. I, I just want to mention on my shadowing that uh, this Ms. Cecina is part of our group that is going is a classified employee but moving towards being a certificated teacher 
And uh, I know she'll do well. Like I said, she's a Ramona grad and a really fine young woman. Uh, just to share a few things, I, um, on, uh, I spoke to uh, Principal Daryl Hansen of Poly, and uh, he tells me that they are working towards implementing at their campus, and I believe some others too, the, the new allowed uh, CIF uh, provision for girls uh, flag football. And anything more we, we can do where young people are more attached to their campus and involved in flag football is long overdue. Uh, on Saturday, I was at Poly for their You Are Enough uh, gathering. Uh, the community and especially district staff had, had uh, booths. Ms. Ms. Shields of Daypack had them too. And uh, it was encouraging. Uh, they had crafts for the little people. But uh, I spoke to our social emotional counseling folks, our counselors, and uh, their case work has doubled since the end of the pandemic. Uh, and we do want to add more in our LCAP brief uh, talks about that and adding more security um, at, at different campuses. Uh, the counselors tell me that for the, the social, emotional, and for the wellness centers, which have been at two campuses, are very well received by the students. It gives them a safe place, a place to talk to counselors uh, interactively. Um, they're, they're concerned with, uh, the kids are with the one thing, they, uh, many of them, all, this applies to all of our K-12, uh, lost those two years of socialization and, and learning, which you do as a young person, and that's, that's been a problem. Uh, they run the gamut of bullying on race, and as we're not surprised, uh, bullying on gender identification. Uh, uh, folks, uh, they're, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a problem that with the vitriol and the, and the uh, et cetera, and the bullying that can be equally from both sides. But uh, again, and I know that some don't like when I say this, but I'm gonna say the truth and I'm gonna say the facts. The California legislature is the one who sets the, the, the law and then school districts, not legislative bodies, we're not a legislative body, uh, implement them in our policies. Some of these things that, that are concerns, and I understand them completely as a parent of two girls who went through poly, uh, need to be translated to our senator and assembly member uh, members uh, because they're the ones making the, the laws, and I'll talk about that again in just, just a moment. Um, I was very pleased uh, to uh, I think it was two weeks ago tomorrow, uh, RUSD hosted a legislative summit, uh, which, uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk and, and Superintendent and, and Assistant Superintendent Power and Super, Assistant Superintendent Perez. It was very good. We hosted it for the RCOE and other districts showed up. Uh, our speakers included uh, our Congress member, uh, Mr. Cano, and uh, names I don't remember, but a representative who is assigned to education from the governor's office and a representative of the legislative analyst's office, which is a non-political, uh, and both talking about forecasts for, for funds. It's going to be something that, that we need to watch. Um, pardon me just a minute. I think that that will be uh, for now. Uh, I do want to be, well, no, I'm sorry. Uh, assembly, woman, assembly member um, Masua, I believe it was, he is the chair of the assembly education. Very uh, interesting man. I, I found him to be delightful. And then Senator Ochoa Bogue was, was there as well. Um, I, was, I got to ask one question, and it wasn't on the budget. I wanted to say, look, you all are passing. There's two things they're doing that are a real problem. And one of them is they're, uh, they're not talking to, I don't know how CTA, California Teachers Association, isn't doing something on this, but I don't have teachers come up to me and say, hey, Tom, I've got a problem with our pay. I've got a problem with my supplies, all of that. What they say, and particularly the last two years, is that their ability to manage a classroom, to discipline a classroom, has been taken away. 
by the California legislature. And, and that goes also for the campus. And, uh, and I said to them, did, did you have teachers? Did you have parents in the room? And they didn't. So, and I, and I mentioned that, do you understand by taking away parent input and rights that, that inflames uh, communities and, and ours included. So they heard me, they said, and uh, he believes that, and she did too, the Senator, that the pendulum with bipartisanship apparently gaining some uh, foot foothold in, in Sacramento, that the pendulum can, can uh, revert to the other way. There is a new assembly bill. I, I forgot the number, 789, is that it? Okay, but um, that will further, further dilute the ability of a teacher to manage their classroom for discipline reasons. And just to say a teacher has 180 days to get a lesson plan through a disruption in a classroom, whether it's K or whether it's 12, uh, in, then cuts into the, their ability to get that 180 days across. and. Um, we need to be involved. I, I've shared to my colleagues recently that I want to see us do more. Uh, one, informing you, the public, on, and our, our, our USD uh, 4,000 employees uh, on uh, legislation. And I would hope, Mr. President, that we can bring this piece of legislation, the one I just mentioned, further diluting uh, uh, classroom discipline to our board have Kevin Gordon give us a brief on it, et cetera. And I would like to see us, if, if I understand it as it's presented now, um, like to see us take a position against. We, we need to, and, and we have a lobbyist that we, for our USD to be involved, but we need to stand up if CTA isn't, uh, and I know our CTA isn't concerned about this, uh, and give the point of view from the classroom what this is doing. So th those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Trustee Kinnear. I'll save my comments for the other agenda items. Okay, thank you. Uh, for my comments, I want to echo uh, what my colleague, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, said about uh, just the importance of the civic engagement for us, you know, to hear from you. Uh, and I want, I'm asking our superintendent to actually restate the s statement that she provided, uh, because I, I know not everyone was able to hear it. And just to have that, that context, please, Superintendent Hill. Uh, this is about uh, the altercation at Martin Luther King High. A video depicting the, an altercation involving students at Martin Luther King High School has been widely circulated on social media this week. This matter has had the full attention of the Riverside Unified School District Administration and is being addressed expeditiously. Since the incident occurred, district staff has been working to ensure the safety and rights of all students are, cons are considered and promptly responded to. We are able to verify that the student involved will no longer be attending King High School. We encourage those who have taken interest in this story to respect the confidential nature of our specific discussions with those involved and the efforts we will continue to make to ensure we provide an appropriate learning environment for each student as required by law. Okay, thank you, Superintendent Hill. Uh, I'll let that statement speak for itself, but the input that was provided, uh, we, we hear you. Our administration is taking note of that. Uh, but I, again, really want to reiterate just the, the, to implore civility and for us to be uh, respectful of each other. At this time, uh, we'll proceed to our subcommittee reports, uh, starting with Operations Board Subcommittee that was held on Tuesday, April 25th. Trustee Hunt is the chair. Uh, we'll provide the report. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. I'll also be calling on my colleague, uh, Trustee Kinnear, who is there with me for the committee. Remember, committees are to dive a little bit deeper into projects and et cetera, and then bring uh, recommendations or whatever. The board makes the decision. Um, I want to say it wasn't on my, my uh, little cheat sheet here, but one of the items we asked uh, Mr. Sam Martin, Assistant Superintendent, to work with the communications department uh, superintendent is to develop a report and a, 
for the website and perhaps hand out at campuses, and, and that includes to our employees, on the uh, Measure O uh, achievements, what, what is happening at the different campuses and where we're going forward. And uh, I, I know you will, and I'm excited about that. Um, so uh, the first was the High Grove. Uh, second, we call it High Grove Two because there hasn't been a name for it yet, but it's it's the second campus. Um, it will be. We had uh, the design team there. Mr. Clark from Renau and Clark are the architects. Uh, the is the CM going to be tilling coal, Mr. Samartin? Oh, there's no CM at this time until this project. The 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 need of the staff because you only have so much. You know, we needed $1.6 billion in 2016, 1.4, and we can only we can only bond 392 for a lot of reasons uh, here in this wonderful city. Um, but it will be funded by a state bond, which we understand not a verified yet, but could be on the ballot in 2024. Therefore, when you have a project that is shovel ready, it's gone through the state design, et cetera, uh, those will get funded first. We probably we will need to con strongly consider a bond within the district as well. Uh, the next item was our uh, an item that was brought up: our transportation uh, update. Uh, in response to the board members' comments, the staff, thank you, jumped on this right away, and adjusting what is now a 10-mile, if you're outside a 10-mile radius of a the campus you're going to you get busing. Let me say that that was originally, when I first came on the board, that was three miles. But in 2018, uh, over and 2019 and 20, from a $450 million budget, uh, this district needed to cut $105 million. Um, so busing was recruited. We asked uh, the staff to bring this back to us. They had some very good numbers based on changing from 10 to, th to three miles which was the old, and we've asked them to come back with some further analysis if that was, say, five miles, and so they'll be working on that. Uh, we are concerned that we do offer free busing to STEM, which, which I've always advocated for because STEM students come from one end of the district all the way next to that school. But, um, but uh, right now for FAMS, uh, Frank Augustus Miller Middle School, uh, we are charging for students that are on ride the bus, and that seems, at least to me, to be inequitable, uh, and we need to address it. And I, uh, that's the report right now to the board on that, but uh, I'm looking forward to coming back. Project team update. Project team is our program uh, right back here. Uh, their modulars date back to the Eisenhower era, and I'm not kidding. And uh, so you, we had an earlier report sent to all of y'all, and you saw it about the upgrades that are going to be there, very nice. Unfortunately, uh, the team that was, or the manufacturer that was picked to design and plan didn't have the high standard of, of bonding this district requires, so they weren't able to go forward. Uh, there is a, a new bid that's coming in and will soon be coming. It's not on tonight. No, it's, no, it's next. Okay. Uh, and but here's something that is really startling to us, and this is not with a PLA or anything else. This is just escalation. We budgeted that project for $10 million. It will now come in at 13.5. That's a 35% increase, which shivers me when we think about uh, bidding uh, north and then uh, Casablanca and some of the other upgrades that we're doing and this board will need to uh, be ready to to address that with with the superintendent's in, input uh, district properties update if a district owns uh, fallow properties in other words there's not a campus on that uh, and they haven't used it for five years they, they pay a penalty to the state is 65,000 uh, so we have some that are we want to take a relook at the the last uh, report and it, a 711 committee is a group of seven citizens to 11 and there are some that need to be specified engineers and real estate people uh, looked at some of these but we've asked the staff to look at and uh, and Mr. Kinnear and I will bring recommendation to the board 
uh, to surplus the property of Victoria and Central. Uh, the, we can't use it for poly because it bifurcates a campus. And uh, we originally were looking at moving poly's varsity and, and uh, softball and baseball over there. With the new start time for uh, high school students, uh, as implemented by the legislature, uh, they, we, we probably, with games starting at now, I think it's 345 or even a little later, uh, lights would have to be considered. And that's something we never wanted to do uh, there and for those neighbors. So we're also looking at the long-held uh, property in the green belt. Uh, you know, eons ago, the district bought uh, 20 acres in the green belt because those areas were expected to have housing and they didn't. And so that's just fallow. We do use it for, for you know, you, when you're doing 50 campuses and mowing and all that, we use it for dumping. We use it for some fertilizer storage. And when modulars go off and need to be held or something, we use it for that. And then the last one is the, the land that is next to Martin Luther King High School. If you look at towards the north, you know, that strip along Van Buren, which is, you know, retail and, to, and the corner is a Circle K, there's 10 acres back there that we purchased. And, uh, and as you recall, we wanted to do a parking lot there because the parking lot is inadequate at uh, King for safety and, and just for numbers. That came in extremely high and we bid it twice. So, uh, we're looking at still needing the parking lot, but what else could be done with the other five acres? And there would be great interest in, uh, I'm sure, for housing and others. Uh, the new laws, when it comes to dispensing of, of uh, education lands, require, as they always did, that we offer it to the local, we offer it to the city and the county and et cetera. And, um, but then you have to offer it to the low income housing uh, bidders. They have to pay a fair market rate and no less than 25% more than that, but um, that would be very interesting. So um, uh, that would really conclude my report, Mr. Kinnear. No, I think you were compre comprehensive with, uh, with, your, with your comments. All of the topics that Mr. Hunt talked about are coming back to the board subcommittee with the exception of project team project team will uh, is coming at uh, an ag our agenda uh, will be on our agenda for the month of may uh, because there's a sense of urgency with getting uh, started with uh, with that project so you'll be hearing about project team next meeting and the rest of the topics uh, you'll hear at a future date Thank you, Trustee Hunt and uh, Trustee Kinnear for your service on that committee and that update. Uh, our next agenda item is consent calendar. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the board vote unless members of the board request to have specific items removed from the consent calendar. I turn to Trustee uh, Hunt. We have uh, four speakers. Uh, and so I just want to remind everybody that uh, this is, uh, unlike item I, this needs to be specific to uh, uh, the, uh, the topic that we're, uh, that we're addressing and to please stay specific to that topic. So our first speaker is Sandy R. I can't read this. Uh, Ms. Maddox, I think, is the next one. Tanisha, followed by Mercedes de Leon. Ms. R, welcome, you have three minutes. Yeah, um, and now we get three minutes. So let's talk about expulsions. Um, it's on your consent item, and if that's what it takes to get three minutes, then we'll get three minutes that way. Um, the student, you say he will not be at King High School on Monday. I know you can't tell us, but if he shows up at Arlington, he shows up at Ramona, he shows up at North, you got a different demographic of students there than you do at King, and I don't think it's going to go well. So let's hope that he's not just going to get shuffled around to another school for these problems to continue. That Those girls, they were so brave to come here and face you tonight because you say you're hearing them, but you're not. You saw that video over three weeks ago. I know because I sent it to you. I'm still on the topic. It's expulsions. 
You didn't do anything because you didn't start the expulsion process three weeks ago when it was brought to your attention the first time. It was brought to your attention again now, and now that you've got the public involved, now you seem to care. Your daughter goes to that school. You say you hear us. What if that was your daughter on that video? Would you be reacting differently? Yeah. I think you know what my point was. The point is, you are not protecting your girls. It's like you said, we have a diverse group of students and they all deserve respect. You're not respecting your girls. If one of you was to expose yourself here, I could file indecent exposure charges on you. But this boy can walk into the girls' locker room and do it and he can get away with it because your policy allows it. And that's not okay. Okay. Trustee Hunt. Trustee Hunt. Mr. Walker, I, wanna, I don't know if it was made clear, but the first instance incident with this student. Uh, we're, we're on uh, the, the we're, we can't talk about this is a item of L17, and as a point of order for the board, the two items on this is a cases for expulsion with a recommendation for suspended expulsion, and the cases for admittance of a student expelled by another district. So speakers need to keep to exactly those items. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speakers, and I pause. I'm having tr trouble reading this. I think it's Tanisha Maddox or Miss Maddox. Okay. Mercedes uh, De Leon and then Lori Lopez. Is Mercedes here? Welcome, Miss De Leon. Uh, you have three minutes. So I'm going to stick to the topic on expulsions. And um, I do believe that student needs to be expelled and not only expelled from the school, but expelled from the district. I really want to push forward towards expelling him and making him relocate to somewhere else that he's wanted because he's not wanted here. Um, I'm not transphobic. I'm transloathing because of the policies and just the nonsense that comes with it. You have an any, you're a girl. You have an Audi, you're a boy. We don't need to come up with creative ways. Just stick to the basics. They've worked and gotten us here this far. And I don't think the school district is enough, is doing enough to protect women, to protect girls. Not every girl is like me. When I got bullied by a boy, you know what I did in third grade here at RUSD? Okay. I broke his nose. Please keep this on the topic of expulsion. It is on the topic. Expel the student from the district and do better to protect our girls. How are you guys hearing us? In one ear, out the other? Is that how you're hearing us? Parents have come here before this meeting to express their concerns, and you guys do nothing to protect girls, to protect women. You're, you're over here protecting a bunch of trannies that are confused and have mental illnesses. We don't all have to agree with, with them. I don't care, Mr. Hunt. I, ha I have the freedom of speech. Okay. Th this is my time. The item I allows comments outside of the agenda, but this topic is specifically regarding expulsion. Okay, well, expel the student from the district. Get rid of him. Clearly, he didn't have a strong male in his life. Probably he's a bastard daddyless. Okay. And, he, All right. and he's less of a man. He's a bitch, in my opinion. Uh, Okay, Th thank you for your comments. We're gonna proceed to Lori Lopez now. Uh, Welcome, Ms. Lopez. The hi. Um, so I actually just wanted to use this time to talk um, specifically about expulsions and suspensions, but it's something that I brought to the board um, in May or June of last year when I asked for this board to direct these folks here to start presenting data to parents. Help us understand, when I come up here and I speak and I hear Mr. Hunt say, it's the state. I'm not an idiot, I know it's the state. But you all do a really poor job of educating parents and families in this district about what you can and can't do, right? I get that in the climate in this state that it's okay for a, a biological male who says that he's transgender to use the female okay. facilities. The, 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 I'm not, just let me finish. Um, 
This but new- I think that helping people, the public, understand um, what in the ed code can you suspend a student for? What in the ed code can you expel a student? The data that I was asking for is not just suspensions and expulsions, because like you said, the state has watered down what the district is able to do. Um, so what I want to know is, is data on uh, violent acts at school, data on illicit drugs on school campuses, data on sexual assaults on school campuses. I don't want to know that Joe Blow got suspended. I want to know numbers, because we all know in all professions, data drives decisions. And if you don't present us data, we don't understand your decisions. And suspensions and expulsions are used to curb behavior, to keep children safe, to keep a campus that is um, cohesive, right? We, we have these measures in place um, not to punish people, right? These measures are in place for a reason because if we don't have consequences for behavior, we all have children. You have consequences for your children, right? We have to continue having consequences and suspensions and expulsions are part of that. So I would just ask for you to present the public data. I wanna know how many fights are on campus because at King last week, in one day there was five. We deserve to know this. So it's for you to... Okay, thank you, Ms. Lopez. All right, that concludes public input on our consent calendar. Does anybody, uh, any board member want to pull any items or we can t- entertain a motion? Thank you, Dr. Farouk. I will uh, motion to approve the uh, consent calendar as presented by staff. Okay, do we have a second by Trustee Lee? Please vote. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Tonight, we have two reports on our agenda, and the first one will be on the possibilities of the instructional program, what it could look like for the future Casablanca Elementary School. At this time, I will turn it over to our Director of Elementary Education, Dr. Jen De Anda, to begin the presentation for us. Dr. De Anda. Hello, good evening, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. We're really, really excited to be here to tonight to talk about Casablanca Elementary School and the possible um, academic and instructional programs that we bring to the school. Our purpose here this evening is to share the background um, and the intentionality that has gone into putting together some of the possible educational programs for Casablanca Elementary School. I'd like to reiterate that these are possible programs and nothing is set in stone. We've gotten a lot of community feedback and this is our opportunity to get your feedback. We will continue to gather more feedback even beyond this, both internally and externally. As we design the educational program for Casablanca, we align with our priorities and specifically the priorities for student learning, well-being, STEM, and the arts as you're going to see that based on the feedback and the desires we've obtained from the community. So how did we get here? In this section, I'm gonna share a little bit about the background and underpinnings of the foundational work that has gone in to um, get us to this point. We've received a significant amount of feedback already from two groups that we meet with on a regular basis, the Casablanca Elementary School Design Committee and the Casablanca Community Advisory Committee. We are grateful for the support of the parents, community members, business members, and staff that have been involved in these groups. Here you see a list of our design committee members. I know it's very, very small here, um, but perhaps when you bring it up online, you could see them and extend your uh, gratefulness to them. Um, I'd really like to thank the amount of time that they've put in, the dedication, um, and just their uh, uh, work towards the Casablanca Elementary School. You will see their input all throughout tonight's presentation. 
In order to get feedback, um, we shared our district vision uh, and why with the committees and then asked them a series of questions that you can see here on the screen to help pull out the desires of the community. We asked about what they'd want their school to look like, how we should guide their students to become leaders, what strengths our students should have, and I would like to thank and recognize Assistant Superintendent uh, Sergio San Martin and his team for their leadership and guidance throughout this process. We took all of the group's feedback and then the team conceived it into a vision for the Casablanca Elementary School. You see here the Casablanca School Educational Vision. In this, um, they came up with eight points, and you'll hear those throughout the presentation as we talk about the educational program, intentionally reaching back to these eight points. The Casablanca community and RUSD really value building and preparing students for uh, the community in the future. Building Riverside's future is what we've envisioned for Casablanca Elementary. The goal here is to be able to prepare students for opportunities both locally and globally so that students are prepared to work right here in Riverside or anywhere in the world that they'd like to go. And we are doing that through RUSD's Portrait of a Graduate Conception. This is the RUSD Portrait of a Graduate. It comes directly from our Guide for Instructional Direction and represents our collective vision for what we want students to know act, think, like, and be. In our portrait of a grad, no represents the knowledge that we want students to have. Act is the ability for students to lead their own learning. Graduates think critically, creativity, solve problems, and tend to their own physical, social, and emotional well-being. These are at the core of what we do here in Riverside to ensure the success of all our students. We also heard loud and clear from the Casablanca community that they value the rich history. That history will be celebrated in the design of the instructional program, which will be centered on taking lessons from the past as we build from the future. In order to build Riverside's future, we want to consider data about what employers are looking for um, in the future workforce. So here you see the results of a study from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is an international organization that works with much of the developed and developing world as well as Fortune 100 companies. And they're saying that they're looking for employees who show empathy and ability to think flexibly, creativity, and curiosity. These are pieces that employers are saying they'd like to see their employees have because they can teach them technical skills but these employee dispositions or soft skills are difficult to teach. And so in RUSD, we call these our professional skills and it's these skills that we wanna see taught through our educational program. We also looked at data here within the United States. Through the Bureau of Labor, statistics show that in the next 10 years, barring the economy not changing too much, that all, educations will, uh, all occupations will grow by about 3.7% or almost 4% and STEM jobs will grow at double that rate. This information should be a key driver and an indicator as to how we are preparing students for the future. Next we'll go into the actual building. You may have seen some of these before but we'll revisit it here for context. Feedback from the communities uh, showed us a high value on coming together. The building takes this into account with several open learning spaces across campus, both indoors and outdoors, to be used for a whole number of purposes. We will see a couple examples of these on the next slides. The community will have access to the campus after hours so that the learning village design can be utilized for both students and the community. And the physical design of the building itself strongly supports the educational program. Here you see an example of a flex space that will be available to all classes for investigations and explorations. We can imagine things such as science experiments and engineering activities in a space like this. And we know that learning doesn't just happen within the four walls of the classroom. There's lots of learning to be done outside. So here you see an example of an outdoor learning environment. 
The next really important piece that the community told us was that we needed to leverage what's already out in the community. There's greatness in Casablanca and throughout the city of Riverside. And we're calling these businesses and this greatness our local assets. We have many local assets here and we want to leverage them so that students know that if they choose to stay within our community, they can do whatever they want here. This picture is actually in one of our classrooms and these are beekeepers in our community who met with our students to show how bees are integral to the agricultural foundation of our community. Here are a couple examples of some of the local assets, governmental agencies, large companies such as Collins Aerosmiths, and smaller companies like Magnolia Heating and Air and the Fox Performing Arts Center. These are important cornerstones of our community and we would like to partner with them. The last piece that we heard from our community is a desire for the school to be unique and special. They want it to be something that's not like anything else. So part of our idea for this is the concept of grade level investigations that every grade from TK through six will have a unique end of the year experience or a project that they'll work towards all year. So for example, in third grade, uh, students learn about the history of Riverside. They could read about it in their books, see it on field trips, write about it, go hear it in the theater, or go taste it in one of our local assets. All of that knowledge could be gearing towards a year-end project in conjunction with the city to install an art project somewhere across the city of Riverside. That's just an example. I'm not saying we've <laughs> committed to that, but I wanted to give you a picture of how these year-end investigations and projects could be really exciting and something that students could look forward to from year to year. And it's unique. It's not done anywhere else in Riverside or not many places that we know of. And when it's successful here in Casablanca, we can see it scaling out to other schools. So we've taken all this information together and I'm gonna share three possibilities for an instructional program. One of the possibilities is a STEM-focused school with a foundation in project-based learning. This is a teaching method where students actively engage in real-world projects that they're interested in. What it looks like is instead of traditional subject time blocks throughout the school day, students work on projects that utilize skills in reading, math, writing, science, history, all at the same time. It is an integrated method of teaching. For example, let's say that students were learning about how plants grow through the pro uh, process called photosynthesis. They would study how the knowledge of photosynthesis was used by farmers in Riverside to develop the citrus industry. Then they would read about the contributions of the citrus industry to the growth and the development of the city of Riverside. And then they'd use mathematical thinking and concepts to measure and track growth of their plants in one of our outside learning spaces. The next concept is again a STEM-focused STEM school based on the foundation of design thinking out of Stanford University. This is somewhat similar to project-based learning, but design thinking is more around having an idea, building on that idea, and understanding the impact that that idea has on someone else. This leverages the empathy skill that we know employers are seeking. It includes generating ideas and making a quick model and then testing it out and sharing it with the people who actually have the problem. And then watching what's, what happens and doing it over again until they solve the problem. For example, here students could be presented with a problem of making a school playground accessible to all students. They may go through a design process where they test a model and then realize that they need to add Spanish markings or wheelchair ramps. So then this, the students would use reading and writing skills to create that proposal of the new playground and they would explain the benefits of the changes. They might use math and engineering design elements to, um, to design the playground and look at distance and angles. And for younger students, the same example might be used um, and to design a prototype for the playground using basic shapes in geometry like in first grade. So it could be accessible to all grade levels. And then the last possibility could be to have a dual language school. I know you're familiar with dual language in RUSD. This would be a little bit different than the DLI we have now, which would be described as a school within a school. This concept is that the entire school would be dual language immersion. Students would study content in both English and Spanish with the goal of becoming biliterate and culturally competent. 
One of the pieces we would need to keep in mind is that if we decided to go this direction, it could potentially have an impact on our existing DLI schools, and we would need to keep that in mind as we make future decisions. Throughout the process of working with the community, we clearly heard that they desire a language focus. Therefore, we have two other ideas related to language. As you know, the city of Riverside has a large deaf and hard of hearing population due to the privilege of having California School for the Deaf in our community. One of the language possibilities to, is to learn and teach students about our deaf culture and American Sign Language. This would not be teaching the content through ASL, but developing a cultural awareness of our deaf community. And we would like to explore partnering with CSDR in this endeavor. Another possible language focus could be the co language of coding. This would take into account our current computer science opportunities and really take it to the next level because here the idea would be for the students at Casablanca to deeply learn one coding language by the time they leave. For example, you see on the screen they could learn HTML or Swift, which is an Apple-based language, or C++, which is used in many of the programs we use today. We're offering this as a possibility because data shows that while STEM careers will grow 8% in the future, the growth in computer science is almost 12%. A coding language focus could really set this school on a path to being unique and setting up students to the future. So last night I had the privilege of sharing these possibilities with the Casablanca Advisory Committee. Many of them are here this evening. The committee expressed gratitude for the effort and intentionality that has gone into the planning for the instructional program at Casablanca. They acknowledged the rich history of Casablanca was honored, while also incorporating a future thinking approach in setting up students for success locally and globally. The committee appreciated the instructional models are based on a collaborative learning styles where all students get the opportunities to contribute and participate. Some of the things we heard from the committees were, coding is the future. It should be the part of the DNA of the school. We should not limit ourselves to, or our students to only one thing. With multiple options, we could draw many students to our school. When we were in school in Casablanca, we were punished for speaking Spanish. It would honor the history to bring Spanish dual immersion to this school. The committee discussed the options and agreed that they would like to have three language options if that were possible, DLI Spanish, American Sign Language, and coding. I wanna thank again that community for their dedication, their hard work, and their commitment to this. Their contributions are just immeasurable. And at this time, that concludes my presentation. I'm going to turn it over to public comment. And then we look forward board to hearing your feedback and answering any questions you have about the educational program. Doc, thank you, Dr. Deanda. We'll turn to public input and I appreciate uh, tr uh, Trustee Hunt for providing our comment cards. We'll start with Cindy Collins, followed by Sean Mill and Bob Garcia. Welcome, Cindy, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, President Fruk, and esteemed board members. My name is Cindy Mendoza Collins. I am the chair of the Casablanca Community Action Group and a member of the Casablanca Education Advisory Group. We have, we first wanna thank all of you for your support, this ongoing support. Um, it's almost time for our school to come. We're almost ready for ground breaking. Had numerous meetings with the school staff and we appreciate each and every one of them that put time into this effort. We did have our meeting last night and went over all these wonderful ideas and yes we did agree that we do want those three languages. We said why do we have to stick to one? We want everything and there's a reason for each one of those and I know other community members might mention it but you know yes coding was our first priority because that's the future. We want to see our kids be able to get into the workforce with that kind of knowledge. The dual language, again, you know, in our past history, if we even dared, when we were, went to the old Casablanca school speak in Spanish, we were, we were hit, actually hit for that because they didn't like that. And then now to have that, and then when they get older and they have that 
other language, then they um, are able to get jobs with translation and get higher pay for that. So, and then with the sign language, we want to show empathy for our students that have that kind of disability, and we want to be able to communicate with them. We want our students to be able to communicate with them. So, we want all three because we. And another reason was because we talked about this. This school is not just for our, our community; it's to draw others into our community. And by offering all these three programs. They'll say, hey, let's go to that school. We want to do this, that, and whatever. So um, we ask you to please support us in that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mendoza Collins. Our next speaker is Sean Mill, followed by Bob Garcia, followed by Kent Nelson. Welcome, Mr. Mill. Thank you. you. Three minutes. Uh, Superintendent Hill, board members. You know, it's, it's a great honor to be here tonight because four years ago, as a member of the Planning Commission, I voted to build a housing project on that site. But I said when I cast that vote, I really hope that the board members that are in the audience today are listening and they go by that site and build a neighborhood school. Because if you do that, I'll be there to support that neighborhood school. I'm here tonight to do that. You know, growing up in Santa Ana in a neighborhood pretty much like Casablanca, the neighborhood school was the center of the community. It was the most important part of the community. When you wanted to organize things, you went to two places. You went to the neighborhood school or you went to the local parish. And you, at the parish's secret, you talked to the nuns. They they're kind of run the show. But at the neighborhood school, you talked to the moms. You talked to the mothers. If you wanted to get anything done in the community, you talked to the moms that are lined up, taking their kids to school every day, and waiting for their kids to get out at the end of the day. So I'm so grateful, and I think that this project is perhaps the most important project coming to this school district in 50 years, because it's going to change the trajectory of Casablanca forever. That neighborhood school is going to have such an impact on the children that are there today and for generations to come. I want to say that I don't live there, but this school must be a dual language school. It must be. History tells us that it must be. When I hear stories, and, and I heard the same stories from, from my friends in Santa Ana before the Mendez versus Westminster ruling, that they used to get wrapped on their knuckles with the, with, with the, the pointer for speaking Spanish. We have a chance to rectify that. We've evolved, and I really think by making the school a dual language immersion, it's a way we'll never be able to say we're sorry or make up for what happened in the past, but it's a way to show that we've evolved. And I'm kind of jealous because I would have loved to have been a kid that had an opportunity to become bilingual. On top of that, I also think that coding is, is a language that they need to learn. I know we want, all th we want all three, but I think coding is the future. And imagine being a young child in these schools, you're getting excited about doing these things. These kids in Casablanca are gonna wanna go to STEM. They're gonna wanna, to, you're, you're setting them up for future success, a success that probably 20, 30 years ago, they may have, families there would have never thought they could have achieved. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mello. Our next speakers are Bob Garcia, followed by Kent Nelson. Welcome, Mr. Garcia. You have three minutes. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, President Farouk, and board members and staff and community. My name is Bob Garcia. I'm uh, Vice President, Community Liaison of the Community Action Group. And also, uh, thank, I'm gonna thank you all for allowing me to extend another term on the Measure L Committee. I come to ask for your support on all three for the following. As a student of Casablanca Elementary School, uh, along with Cindy, uh, like I told the, the committee last night, we fought for the same tricycles in kindergarten. The reason why I say all three because in my life I was uh, a um, retired mobile disc jockey for almost 40 years. I also was a dance instructor for three years. So the reason why I say all three because 
in college also, when I took computer science, we were learning the formulas for what we now have as our computers and cell phones. So with all three, what I see is the other plus is that with design, I was never working well with my hands because I, being a southpaw, we didn't have the number of scissors for us with, that were southpaw. So what I see here is, is a plus for the, our students. One, like I said, being a mobile disc jockey, back then I didn't have any, anyone to teach me about music in the industry. Now we have the, the local assets that can help us with that. And as also with, like I said, with the computer science, that would be a plus. The design as well. Students may be better using their hands than I was and can be in the future. So if we're allowed all three, we can have students to learn differently what I learned as one person. So we ask your support and thank this group of staff. Myself as the creator of this project almost 18 years ago, I never thought it would be until we started working with you all as a board and the staff. And now here this year, we're gonna have the groundbreaking. And I feel great about that. I get emotional just thinking about it because we had the time to work on this project and now it's gonna be a project that's gonna be a school in the next couple of years. And I thank you for tonight. tonight. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Our last public comment is Kent Nelson. I actually thought we were talking a little more tonight about Measure O, but um, since you brought up coding, let me put my vote in for that because even a semi-smart guy like me can make a living doing some coding. Um, my concern is as we're breaking ground on these schools, and you know, for a long time I've been involved with Measure O and I want to make sure we can complete everything. And I'd just like to make sure we kind of take a look at inflation, cost overruns, how the PLA uh, agreement's going to affect costs. I know at the Port of LA, it rose costs from 26 to 30%. Uh, how we look at higher interest rates and the possibility of bond funding not going the way we are, and planning to make sure we can complete all the projects we start. And that short and sweet, that was kind of my concern. I, I'd really like to make sure every school gets touched, that every parent that's gonna be paying on the bond gets a benefit. And I think it's time to just really take a look at that, hypothecate some worst case scenarios, and you know, make sure we're doing a good job so we can continue to build more schools. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and before we go to board member comments, I want to acknowledge that in the beginning of the meeting, we introduced our new principal uh, for the school. Principal Torres is here, and so I think it's great it's, it's a really uh, great gesture, I think, from the board and the, the district to invest in ha having a, a principal already coming on board out of respect to the community to make sure that this process is very thoughtfully done. So appreciate your leadership there. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues now, uh, whoever we're starting with Trustee Lee. Oh, I don't need to go first, but I can. Um, I, was, I was thinking to myself, that I'm, I'm glad staff didn't have six or seven options on there we'd have a real a real trouble on our hands um but great great ideas great input grateful to the casablanca community and all those that were involved to provide this input i think overall i'm excited at whatever we have at that school because i know wherever we end up it's going to be uh, amazing and extraordinary so uh, i'll start that with preface with the rest of my comments <clears throat> so i um appreciate the comments about having the school being a dual language and i can empathize and sympathize with those uh you know paying respect to to the to, to the history of the school and, and to the 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 wrongs that were committed back then um, so i can see a desire to do that um, and i think it's definitely something that we need to consider uh, how, however uh, the school that's closest to where casablanca is is washington uh, and that is a dual language school uh, that I would imagine pulls, did I say dual language school? Dual language school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, 
pulls kids from the Casablanca community. So my concern would be how, how does that decision, should you make that decision, uh, impact Washington and the surrounding programs? And I'm glad staff is already thinking about that because uh, I think it will have a, a, a big effect. Also, our, our, our DLI program has grown significantly. Um, and I think we're at seven or eight schools now um, and we're already having some difficulties attracting, uh, you know, high-end talent that has the credentials to be able to teach those programs. So I don't want to compromise any of the other programs at the schools unless we're going to consider uh, making changes there by adding another another dual, dual language school. So something to consider. Um, I like the idea also of uh, American Sign Language. Um, we're seeing that implementing those offer, uh, offerings at some of our high schools is a big demand, right? So we know the demand is there, and I think we should listen to our customers, our students, that if that's something they'd want to learn, then they're more likely to be engaged in school as if we can provide it. And if we can provide it at an earlier time, um, even better. Uh, I, I remember when I, when I was uh, in Washington a long, long time ago, uh, my fifth grade teacher was uh, knew American Sign Language, and she taught the fifth grade class um, lots, uh, lots of sign language. So that was a great experience uh, for me. Um, so while if it doesn't necessarily make for a great fit uh, at Casablanca, I think that could be an opportunity somewhere in our district to provide uh, ASL down to the elementary level for our students. Um, Last on the uh, the coding, uh, I think right now that seems to be the the design that I'm most interested in, only because it's not offered yet at RUSD. Um, and we've heard uh, most recently, I want to say from there's a guy at Google. I don't know if you guys remember his name, Jamie. I think he was Google. What's that? Jamie. Yeah. A uh, fascinating guy that worked for Google in their education department, and he helped start a coding academy, I believe, in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'd be really interested for staff to do, uh, if you've already done it, maybe to share it, some information about other school districts who have started coding academies or coding as a second language for students and how successful uh, that has been. Um, because I, I get to thinking, like, just like our students in sixth grade DLI, they become bilingual and biliterate. If our students in sixth grade, or maybe it takes a little bit longer, seventh grade, eighth grade, um, can complete some of those certificates that are offered at uh, other schools that, I know they couldn't go to work yet, but that they would have those skills that adults have to work for companies to complete these coding processes. I think that would be, be pretty amazing. And I think it would set a great foundation uh, for students who attend a program like that uh, to pursue a career in STEM or maybe attend the STEM, STEM Academy that's already at RUSD uh, with, with a lot of success. Uh, so I uh, don't know that I have a particular, I'm not sold on any particular idea because again, I think all of them will be fantastic. Um, but I, I, would, I would probably lean at this moment towards something involved in the coding um, coding side. And then, sorry, one last thing I wrote down, but I didn't share. I was thinking about how you incorporate this, the Spanish language aspect um, without necessarily making it a dual language school. And I think about countries and school systems in countries across, across the world that teach their students English as soon as they start school. And I don't think they're necessarily dual language schools. It's just one of the subjects that they learn in school. So I'm, I'm wondering if we can start offering Spanish as part of the curriculum, not necessarily as a dual language, but just learning that language from kindergarten like they do in, a, in other countries. So I wonder if we can solve that, that concern of um, paying respect to the culture of that community and the students that attend there and paying homage to the history if we could somehow cross that bridge. So uh, that's, that's it for me. Before we move on, Mr. Lee, you made a comment regarding uh, just your curiosity about you know, are there um, elementary schools that have a coding focus? I think Dr. Kong has some information that might be interesting to share on that. Hi, good evening, Dr. Farouk. 
Superintendent Hill, members of the board. Uh, so that is something that we did research as part of one of the uh, instructional options for the community. Um, we checked with our NSF partners, our scale partners, and there is no such model that exists. So it actually would be um, one of the first models that exists, not just in California, but just nationwide. We also checked in the state of Texas because Texas does allow um, coding as a language for high school students other than um, some of the other foreign language options. And even in Texas, they did not have an elementary school currently using this model. So that being said, you feel, still think it's something that could be done? Absolutely. All right. That's what I'd like to hear. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, if my colleagues are okay with this, I wanted to just check so we don't put them on the spot, but if Principal Torres is willing to give his thoughts to the presentation, is, is that okay with you guys if we hear from him first? It might inform your own perspectives when you give the feedback. Principal Torres, if you want to come to the, the mic. Welcome. Uh, I mean, so first I want to say I was fighting back tears um, listening to the three community members. I'm taking in the significance of what's about to happen. And so your experiences, me tocó mi corazón. So thank you. Um, instructional programs, whew, it's going to be an amazing school. Um, with the STEM focus at the Casa Blanca neighborhood. Um, I'm so excited, I, I got goosebumps. I, with the coding, I've worked closely with Dr. Kong. I think at, at some point we had 70% of our teachers trained with coding back at, at Taft Elementary. So I, I come with that experience with coding if we do proceed with that. Um, I'm understanding and I'm taking in the amazing impact that our neighborhood school can have on the rest of the community. Um, hooking up with the partnerships, um, las, las mamás allí que ayudan, um, made reference to the moms that will be a great resource. Um, they, our Hispanic or Latino community, they have a thirst. They want to be involved. They, 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 you put a parent workshop, they will come. Um, my mind's just going crazy with the possibilities. Um, just, um, I think I'll, I'll be quiet now. It's a long night. So I just want to share that. Thank you, Principal Torres. We're very excited about uh, what your leadership will represent for this project. Thank you. I'll turn it now to Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you. I. Um... This has been a long time coming, and, and I know that I'm new here, but I'm not new to the experiences of our community. Um, this is a, a moment of, of, of restorative justice. This is a moment of restoration. This is a moment of um, more than giving back what is lost, but we should be looking for not just replacing what was lost, but excelling and dreaming. Um, I am so happy that Casa Blanca is, um, has a, a principal that loves the community, that wants to serve the community. But what I'm seeing more is that he wants to dream with the community, what's possible, what hasn't been done before. I think about language as well, and I think about reversing the wrongs of history. It's gonna be done. Because in that, how, in, that, in that community, whether it's a, a dual language school or not, it will be a dual language school because of the families that will be there, because of the principal that will lead, because every day you will hear his announcements in su idioma, in su cultura, uh, las kermeses. Like I can just imagine the moms cooking and bringing in food in the way that we love is through our food and through our culture. So culture is, is going to be embedded. It's going to be in the DNA of that school. And so I'm really happy about that. So yeah, like why couldn't we do coding in Spanish? Why couldn't we talk about uh, STEM in Spanish? Why couldn't we? We do it at home, right? We do it at home. We, we go from Spanish to English. We go to Spanglish and everything in between. Why couldn't we? Why couldn't we imagine a reality like that? Because that's a reality of what's happening in our homes. 
So it's just been an extension of what's happening in our homes. So imagine the sense of belonging and the warmth and the, you know, we're constantly talking about getting our students engaged and making them feel like they have a, a sense of belonging in their school. Well, what if that school looks and feels and sounds just like their home, right? And so I, 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 I would like to explore how we could do the most because this school deserves it. All of our schools deserve it. This has been a long time coming. We've been talking about you know, expanding CTA, CTE pathways in, in K through six. So I would like to start a conversation with us and with the, with the board of what would that look like to expand CTE K through six at Casa Blanca and then being able to explore some of those multiple avenues and maybe not limit the school for this is a school that does X or Y, but has options just like we offered, you know, our, our high schools. I mean, I, I think that this is an opportunity to dream, right? We, we dreamed, the community dreamed this school would, would eventually be built and here we are. So let's just keep dreaming. And I, and I just want to say uh, thank you to to the cabinet that has worked so hard to make this happen and to the community. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just really happy and really excited for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Trustee Hunt. Let them applaud for Dr. Alexander. They, they, sh they should. I won't have that same kind of passion from that end, but I have great passion for this. I have worked on, uh, since I came on the board, neighborhood schools for the east side, which is very much long overdue, and there should have been one 16 years ago, and, uh, and Casablanca. Uh, but I want to really, before we get too off it, I want to remind us that the real folks we need to thank are the voters of RUSD, who were told on Measure O that a priority of the board would be neighborhood schools. That includes High Grove, East Side, and Casablanca. You know, by a 70% when you needed 55, I think it was, uh, they approved that. So let's remember our neighbors and fellow Riverside, our USD neighbors that, that, that did that. Um, with, yes, I'd like to see a dual language program. Dr. Kong uh, has some work to do in front of him, but I know you can do it. If there's no other plans around the state and others, uh, well, we were the first to desegregate. And now as we come back, as Dr. Alexander talked about, we need to find those uh, roots. I'm going to remind us too that Casablanca will school elementary will pull from uh, current kids being bused and everything, and and busing will be eliminated. But that we'll have a population is this right about 600 when we open the school. The school can accommodate up to 750 students. Right. But but we we're projecting 600. My point being that these type of innovative programs. CTE, as, as mentioned, uh, and others, uh, you know, dual immersion, will market it properly, will pull from the neighborhoods to the south of Victoria that would be interested in being at Casablanca. And I, I think I'm confident that it will pull uh, educators in our district that want to be at a new school, and particularly one this uh, innovative and this important. Casablanca will be defined by this school, as Mr. Mill was uh, referring to. Um, I did mention that uh, I believe that this school can also, and particularly its story of going back to the grandmothers and the uh, petition in, uh, I think it was 1818, I'm 1918 or something like that, and they got a fertilizer barn for a school, but when they finally got their school, um, and then when they finally lost their school, it, it was it defined Casablanca. I remember going to the funeral of uh, the first African-American teacher, Hazel Russell Hawkins, who was assigned to Casablanca. And uh, this gentleman who's about my age got up, I don't remember his name, Cindy, and he talked about being a student at Casablanca. And on the second day, he decided, oh, the heck with it, I'm gonna ditch school. And he, you know, some of us used to do that. And uh, he said that evening, on his front door was a knock, and it was Hazel Russell Hawkins, his teacher, that wanted to talk to his parents. He said, I never missed a day of school the rest of my life at RUSD. And so, it, and Mr. Torres, you met, have you met Mr. Madden there? Mr. Madden, wave your, your hand. Mr. Madden is the son 
of the first Casablanca principal who, is, who served 41 years, so hang on for a long ride, and, uh, and to this day is still revered in, in Casablanca because, and he became a very important individual. He brokered a lot of things for them in the city, but because he did walk the neighborhood, he did learn people's names, he did go to CAG, and I'm looking forward to you going to CAG, and I'd like to attend along with Superintendent and Dr. Farouk. Uh, so I, I do want to commend you and, and all your staff, Dr. Sosa. Uh, I am interested, as I mentioned to you, in a, a uh, musical career, industry, musical industry career thing there. Uh, I've committed to look at grants for that as well. There is a, I won't mention his name, it's not fair to him at this time, but there's a very globally famous Hispanic guitar player who I first saw at the Woodstock uh, film and who has an education foundation. I think we have a great story to tell. And um, the other day when I, at EOC, just shows you the network of Unified. I happened to mention, this guy asked me, one of our, our administrators over there, asked me about uh, Casablanca and what's gonna be taught. And I just shared with him, well, I'd sure like to contact, you know, this rock and roller and, and all of this. And he said, oh, well, he says, I'm friends with his son. You know, so there, there's Riverside for you. But uh, very impressed with the work you've done, all of you. And uh, just looking forward to, to more and more and, and looking forward so much to that groundbreaking and that first day of school. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunt, uh, Trustee Kinnear. Just a couple of quick comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm happy that Mr. Torres is with us. Uh, that will make the single biggest difference, in my opinion, in how we unfold with, uh, with, with this process. So uh, happy to have you here. Uh, I was just reminded when, when we were talking about what's, what schools in the nation uh, might have some of these programs, we gotta make sure that we give Mr. Torres a budget a budget now because he needs to visit and he, you know he needs to explore etc cetera, etc cetera. so this board needs to, uh, to to make sure when we're looking at LCAP dollars uh, how do we start uh, funding uh, some of the things that uh, that Mr. Torres needs to uh, to to accomplish with uh, with with other things um, and I it it's it's an important neighborhood school but more than that, I, I hear that, that we wanted to, to draw people from the outside. So we have to be very, very careful about limiting some of our ideas in, in regard to the focus of the school. Because if we have a music school and a, and, uh, and a STEM school and a language school and this school and that school, we're, we're not going to have we're not going to have the the draw and the and the expertise that uh, that that we need. Uh, I haven't looked at uh, at the attendance boundaries that we're proposing. I wasn't a part of that discussion. Uh, but when we're looking at attendance boundaries, we 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 need to make sure that if it's a a school that's going to draw from the outside, uh, that uh, that that we plan for uh, for that. It's hard to draw students from the outside uh, into, uh, into a school. So uh, we have to be very, very focused on, uh, on what our thoughts are with this school uh, with, uh, with, with that in mind. Uh, are our plans going to be successful with drawing kids to the school from, uh, from outside the attendance areas? And I, I think coding can could uh, could could be a way to uh, to to do it. Uh, there's no question in my mind. And language, I mean language, I mean that that's sort of a, in my mind. Uh, duh, it's got to be language uh, for our, Casa, our Casablanca community. So those are the two things that that most interest me. And then I leave the rest to hearing more from Mr. Torres and from the community and other district experts. So thanks. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Thank, thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, so, you know, I really just want to express, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, poetic and heartfelt, very soulful,
comments expressed. Uh, really uh, appreciated Dr. Hernandez Alexander's uh, passion and uh, just also just what it represents to, for you and just what a great asset you are uh, to our board and our community. So th thank you for, so much for your passion. Uh, so I have a few questions, uh, but so one is, you know, Obviously, as you guys can imagine, I'm a big proponent of coding and, you know, been obviously very advocate of that. Um, this is for Mr. Kong. Uh, I'm a, I want to defend a little bit that our district has been doing a lot on coding, right? I mean, yes. at, at elementary school level and beyond, uh, and, and there's a variety of things, not just through the curriculum itself, um, but also extracurricular and so forth. So my question to you is, um, what what would this look like in contrast to that? Because I feel like we should acknowledge that we 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 are a leader nationally in coding right now. Yeah, and you're absolutely correct. We have opportunities just across the board through all grade spans. This would be a little bit more specific in that we would partner with uh, Mr. Torres and the staff and really focus on one specific language. So right now, students get exposure to multiple different coding languages, but this would be uh, similar to the DLI program where they're learning Spanish uh, exclusively, this would give them a skill in essentially like JavaScript or C++. So we would uh, kind of set one language for the students to develop throughout their time at that school. I see, okay, th th that's, th that's helpful uh, context. Um, my next uh, question is, so I see like um, in the possibility to d the design thinking uh, there's a couple of partners listed there. I'm not sure if they are partners, but if I just wanted someone to elaborate on what they represent. It says the Institute of Design at Stanford and IDEO. What is that? Because I didn't remember if that was elaborated during the presentation. Yeah, so the um, whole process of design thinking is a framework of solving problems that stemmed from Stanford University and the organization IDEO. So they partner with not just educational partners, but um, businesses, nonprofits, and train staff on the implementation of design thinking and the process that you use to solve problems and prototype. So if we were to choose this model, we would work to um, train our staff in going through what's called um, D school or design school to get that framework as a way to um, incorporate it into the instructional model for their students. So uh, I really appreciate what Trustee Kinnear was mentioning about, you know, the identity of the school and uh, us being able to have something that we really delve deep and have like a very core competency associated with it and identity. Because from a marketing standpoint too, you know, if, like if it's like a, if it's a STEM focused school in general, that's, that's an identity that can attract if we, uh, and I know that it has been expressed from the community about wanting it to be a, a, something that attracts uh, to the community. Um, Given that, also piggybacking off what Trustee Lee said, which I thought was really interesting about, okay, let's look at what are the qualities of what we want. Like we want to have the Spanish language culture and, and, uh, and language itself embedded in it. What are different ways where that could be expressed that, you know, to create more flexibility? And it's not to say that we don't do anything. You're just saying, let's have, let's look at that. I, I, so I really, I want to piggyback on those things. Um, but Get, keeping that in mind, I want to know what is staff's, I, I don't know who, it, if it would be Dr. DeAnne or who, what's your general reaction and your response when you heard from the community that they wanted a combination of the sign language, the coding, the STEM, the, I mean, when they said that all of the above, what's your official response to that, I guess? That I'm glad we open in two years. <laughs> Um, big dreams, and I respect and value those big dreams, and it's going to take us some time to um, just work through what that would all look like and really put it into a cohesive vision that does have an identity and, a, to your point, a marketing um, aspect to it, but also uh, means something to the heart of the people of Casablanca. So, but f from a standpoint of, like, practicality and feasibility, because I, I can imagine like the possibility one and two, the project-based STEM-focused design thinking, you could imagine that, that those are complementary and could be integrated. Um, but how, again, from a feasibility standpoint, how f feasible would it be practically in one school to, uh, to be able to integrate the, the 
uh, the, uh, the, to me, the coding, uh, I'm a big, I, I would be a huge proponent of that. There, there's no question about that. But I think that the Spanish language thing is really important. The American Sign Language, we do have that at other schools currently. Um, and so my sense is if, we're, if it's something that is offered, if these are options as opposed to like a full-throated identity, could they be accommodated then? Dr. Farouk, if you don't mind, I'd like to take that question. Uh, I don't think it's possible to know right now. That's one reason why we wanted to have Principal Torres on board so that he can really be here at the beginning of all the conversations because you can get a feel for what excites people. Uh, so I'll give you some possibilities of things that could be done. We could have some fo focus groups where there's conversations with, with the team and community members to see what generates interest. We could have activity nights. You know, I think in Dr. Kong's previous life, um, you know, he tried family math. He tried some other things. Some, some activities got a lot of uh, participation and some didn't. So I think we, can, we have time now to try some activities and, and things and see which ones really spark the interest of the children because no matter what we want, <laughs> they have to be interested in it too. Um, and then see what the interests of the families are. So I love that. I think that's, and I think this is the advantage of us bringing on the principal early, having the, the, getting in, engaged on the curriculum before the groundbreaking later this year. Uh, and l like you said, at the end of the day, the students are, are going to speak. And, and the thing is, we can focus this uh, because the fact that the, the, the students that reside in Casablanca that are at Washington or Taft or other schools, those same students could be providing that input and reaction. And so we could get a very authentic pulse on what, what resonates with them because obviously all of these ideas do sound great and to have all of them uh, integrated would be great to all of us but um, where where would the students land on this and so I think that's great uh, what just, so just out of curiosity what from your per perspective what are you hoping to accomplish from the board like obviously you're introducing this to us getting a general reaction is there any more specific thing because I know you're going to be uh, focus grouping this and having time to get reaction but what other direction do you need from us right now? I feel like it was provided. We wanted to hear, have you hear the voices that have been contributed thus far and to where we're at and then hear your voice and your stance. And uh, overall, it sounds like you're, you're very supportive of the innovation of it. And, and that's uh, encouraging to us. And, and I think Mr. Torres coming in too, that's encouraged by that because we can take all of this and start to meet with students, meet with community and really refine um, so I think just your level of interest in, in the different things has been very helpful. And so you could uh, start taking each of these concepts and start getting that feedback and start testing these things out and then coming back to the board and getting a sense of where there's more energy towards issues. Is that, is that the next step then would be? Yes, that would be the next step. Okay, that's great. Uh, I'll turn it to Dr. Hernandez-Alexander now. And that was actually the question I was going to ask is, is, is it feasible to do some type of like piloting activities with the community to see what type of activities would track? Is that, a, is that an option or possibly, is it feasible? It is, yes, yeah. it is feasible. We can, and we have a great instructional team that is thinking about these things and can put things together. And then we've got great teachers who are willing to try things and pilot for us and, and so we can bring that into campuses looking at this time of year i would say that would be a path for next year okay yeah of course yes of course and i just want to make one final comment and i don't think i need to say it but i feel like i do need to say it uh you first of all we, we've gotten to this place because this has been community voice led it's been community led every detail down to the curriculum that we're going to offer. And I just want to commend the district, commend the board for doing that, commend you for doing that. Um, I, I, I want us to be very, very, very mindful to be always checking in with the community that we're serving. Um, I'm really glad that we have a principal in place and I feel like the lines of communication need to be constant as we move forward, as we do things because it's expedient or we do things because of a timing or we do things because of funding. Like when we do things because we administratively need to do them, I hope that we continue to tap into the community 
and use uh, the principal, principal Taurus as that, that, that go-between of that conversation, that it continues to be fluid, because I would hate for us to get to this point, and then suddenly the community lost grasp of the thing that they were working so hard to get. And, I, and that could happen unintentionally just by being trying to be efficient sometimes in, in an organization. So I just, I feel like I need to say that. I don't think it's gonna happen, but I just want us all to always be mindful to check back in. Thank you. Well said, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Uh, Superintendent Hill, you wanted to say something? Yeah, in part, I just wanna uh, amplify um, some of the things that you said and Dr. NHA said um, that we just test something. We use a design thinking approach. We have some empathy with the community. We can test you some You did go ideas. to Stanford. I did go to Stanford. <laughs> I didn't go to the D school. I would love to go. Maybe a sabbatical, something like that. Um, <laughs> um, so we can, we, can, we can test some ideas and, and see what works. In addition to the instructional program next steps, Principal Torres will have to be dealing with the construction next steps and the attendance area next steps. And then this board will have in the summer, um, in, in part to really answer these questions in depth, a study of our existing DLI programs, which might only be a part if we choose to do Spanish as a language other than English, you know, language instruction rather than DLI. So it'll be a broad, considerations of a lot of things moving at one time so that we can converge and the whole time we should stay in contact with the people and eventually the students. Absolutely. Thank you. Well said, Superintendent Hill. Trustee Lee. All right. Yeah, I like where this conversation is going. Um, I just want to speak on whatever focus this school ends up being. I do think it needs to be a focus and that's not necessarily to try to limit what the school can be but something to unify the school. Um, I think if there's any fault with our DLI program is that you have a sc two schools at one school and it creates a, f a, f a friction between the two, between staff, between students. If you're part of the DLI program at a school, if you're not, if you're a teacher at a DLI program or you're part of the English track. And I, I don't want that to happen. Um, at any future DLI schools. So I think we need to find some way if, if, if uh, a language, in, a foreign language is gonna be incorporated there or, or even ASL, to find a way to unify the school so you don't have that same side effect that we're experiencing at our other schools. Um, the question I had, because it's been brought up by a couple of, of my colleagues, is about attracting students to the school from outside the area, if I understand correctly. And I don't ever remember having that conversation. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but how many students are we currently busing out of Casablanca? I think it's 700. Out of which uh, attendance area again? The Casablanca, Casablanca. neighborhood. We're how many bus, were busing? We're busing uh, close to 500 students to six schools. To six schools, okay. All right, so there is some potential opportunity for kids from outside the attendance area to attend, unless we change the attendance area to make Casablanca adjacent um, for that new school. All right, that was just my other my other point. Okay, because I think we should. I, I think that could be a a, a, a potential op opportunity should we need more students to attend. But I obviously I think the focus should be meeting the needs of the community that's there and serving those students. Um, and then if there is space, then you know we can have a process for that. If, if I may, uh, Dr. Dr. Superintendent Hill. Um, Dr. Indiana can speak to it better than I can, but I, that was, I understand that that was one feature that the community members said is they would like um, for students from areas other than the Casablanca neighborhood to also be welcome to the school so that they make, make friends in other places. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is a desire of the community to be a uh, high prestige. We, we use the term gold medal, but not in the sense of the gold ribbon or anything with the state of California, but just a sense of a gold medal, a, a wonderful prize school that attracts students from within the community and outside the community. That was expressed by our Casablanca team as a, a desire. Um, 
I'll, I'll just end with this, it kind of ties the focus and kind of the prestige aspect. I, I think our most successful programs that attract students and have good results, whether that's, you know, IB program at North, Project Lead the Way at King, you know, the STEM Academy with science, uh, any of our DLI programs, um, arts at Ramona, they're successful and they draw and they engage because they have a focus, right? Everybody's focused on a common unifying goal and that brings everybody together. So that's all. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, so that uh, concludes our public comments. I just r really want to reiterate again, uh, appreciation to all of you uh, staff that have been diligently working on this. Again, Principal Torres for taking the mantle, uh, but most importantly, the community, uh, Casablanca community, uh, for everything that you've been doing um, way beyond the time frame that we've been doing this, this school project. Uh, very, very grateful to you. And know that we'll be following up with all of you guys shortly. So thank you, everyone. So uh, our next uh, report is on, from staff is on the multi-tiered systems of support and those inclusive practices. This report will be, will be presented by our assistant superintendent, Dr. Dan Sosa. Uh, Director of Special Education, SELPA, as well as Ms. Kirtan Frosto. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sosa. Thank you much, Dr. Farouk, uh, Superintendent Hill and board. Thank you for having us today. Uh, myself and uh, Ms. Kirsten Reno-Frosto get the opportunity to share our annual year-end update on our uh, multi-year work, building our multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, and I will turn it over to Kirsten for this first section. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. Our report tonight, our presentation, will report on staff actions related to the Board of Education's desire to implement multi-tiered systems of support and inclusive practices. It will include a review of year two actions and also the success measures. We did have uh, some colleagues and educators from the field here this evening, but they've gone ahead and gone home due to the, the late hour. This visual captures our Board of Education priorities and how the work of MTSS aligns to those priorities, as well as the actions of the local control and accountability plan. Our RUSD definition of MTSS leads with our District Y, which is our mission, and focuses on our intentional um, work of providing academic, behavioral, and social-emotional support to students that they require to thrive. We're going to begin with a review of action plans for year two, and a few of our key actions displayed up here beginning with providing professional learning for all 50 of our school site leadership teams, as well as the educational services staff. We provided five sessions over the year to each of them that focused in establishing school-wide behavior expectations, as well as how to teach and practice those expectations for students. We also engaged in work redesigning our behavior interventions and discipline practices and reviewing board policies for MTSS. Work that we've begun but we have not yet finished and will continue into next year is developing a comprehensive communication plan for our educational partners. Lead researchers have identified seven evidence-based elements of positive behavior supports that we see here. And that was the focus of each of our professional learning sessions that we provided to staff. They include strong site leadership, also positive preventative and proactive systems, clearly identifying student expectations, behavior expectations that are taught and practiced throughout the year, consistent use of praise to reinforce those positive behaviors, as well as the use of correction in order to uh, reinforce and those positive behaviors. Also, we have how to use data for decision-making and then supports and intervention. We also engaged in work in three major areas across the district for system-wide and sustainable systems. 
That is MTSS psychologists. We have two of them in the district. They met with each of our 50 sites throughout the year to ensure that we were on track with establishing those positive behavior expectation plans for the year. They also, or we also met with our preschool MTSS inclusive practices team. This is made up of general and special education classified and certificated staff who collabor are collaborating on how we can ensure that we have these systems in place for our very youngest learners and have set them up for success. Then we also engaged in work all throughout the year with our district discipline work group. What they did was work on aligning our practices, our discipline pro processes, to the work that we've been doing with positive behavior systems. One area of work that we had identified and had hoped to get to but have not yet, and this work will continue into next year, is the reimagining of how we document support to each of our individual students at school sites through what we call student success teams. These meetings include both staff as well as parents that come together to collaborate around what the strengths of each student is and then how we can develop plans to support students in the areas that they're, ex they're experiencing some challenges so that we can increase their success. We have some areas of measures of success that we'd like to share with you this evening. One is that at the beginning of the year, we set three site deliverables for our, this, the work this year. The first is that at the beginning of the year, whatever the expectations were that every classroom had, that those would be clearly communicated in each classroom. Then, through the work of this year with the site leadership teams, that all 50 of our school sites by June of 2023 would have identified a school-wide positive behavior system that was informed by data. At the beginning of the year of 2023, in August, when students return, we have set a goal that these classroom behavior systems, each classroom system, will be aligned to those school-wide expectations. The reason that that is in August and not being done now is so that we inclu can include the student voice of students in the classrooms at the beginning of the year in August, and those are generated collaboratively aligned to these ex school-wide expectations. We are very pleased to report that as of this month, 100% of our sites have completed those behavioral expectation plans, which is two months ahead of schedule. We also have sites that are already piloting portions of their plans that include teaching students what those expectations are and what they look like in different areas of the school campus, not only in classrooms and instructional settings, but in the cafeteria, in the library, on the playground. And then also, we've been providing support with our school psych or our MTSS psychologists to sites helping them to finalize those plans, including communication out to their communities for the implementation next year. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sosa. Thank you, Ms. Frosto. For the next couple of slides, I'll be sharing some of our universal screener data. Uh, just by way of reminder, we do universal screeners here in the district so that we can get a pulse on where students are at respective to their readiness for high quality instruction. The, the universal screeners don't tell us if students are on grade level. What they tell us if students are ready with those base skills in order to be ready for the high quality instruction that our teachers bring every day. The first screener, we've talked a lot about this and we're really proud of the extent to which we screen our students is in social emotional learning. For this year, we screened over 34,000 students in our winter screening period. That's 2,000 more than last year at this time. 74% of our students are what is considered on track, um, which means they have a low level of risk for different areas of social emotional learning and support. That is attributed to all of the support that this board has generously provided to school sites in the way of MTSS counselors and increasing our SAP counselors throughout the years of which we heard some speakers speak of a little bit earlier. 
When we compare where we are this year as opposed to where we were last year, we're about two percentage points higher than we were last year. 2% might not sound a lot, but when you put it in the context of real people, that's 680 more students that are on track. That is an entire elementary school worth of children that are in a better place than they were previously uh, based upon all the supports in the system. The next piece of data that I'd like to share is on our TK6 universal screening in reading. We have 59% of our students that are making expected growth in reading and 60% of our students making expected growth in math. Let me just take a few moments to explain what expected growth is. For the measure that we use, expected growth is a measure that looks like, uh, excuse me, that looks at how students are improving from where they started. It takes into account every student that is screened, not only in Riverside Unified, but screened throughout the nation, looks at where the student began in fall, tracks where the student is progressing at one particular point in time. The national average for growth from one period to another is 60%. 60% is considered at uh, national average. And as you can see, we're scoring right around national average in that growth. We focus on growth because it tells us if students are ready and have the skills for that high quality instruction that teachers are providing for them every day. One of our pieces, you, you um, said it, Dr. Farouk, in the introduction, this is MTSS and inclusive practices. One of our major goals with this work that we're doing over the next four to five years is to help create classroom environments that are more um, inclusive for, for uh, all the types of learners that we have. And so in this particular measure, what we're looking at is the percentage of elementary students who are able to get support within the general education classroom if they are students with disabilities. In the past, students would have to leave the general education classroom to get support. Where we are as of March, 67% of our elementary students are, uh, who are students with disabilities receive support within the general education classroom. That's 13 percentage points higher than what our goal is. In real numbers, that's 1,827 elementary students out of about 2,700 that are students with disabilities that are receiving services in their classroom that meet and support their progress within their IEP. We also ask partners what their experience is like. Part of this work of building cohesive systems is professional learning on the part of the educators within the system. So let's take a look at what some of our teachers are saying. We have a goal that 85% of our teachers or our uh, educators, I should say, because we, we educate more than just teachers, um, that 85% of our educators leave that session with a plan to utilize their learning. Research tells us that when we have professional learning um, opportunities in which the participants leave with a plan to execute that, they are much more likely to do those behaviors. Um, to now, we have 87% of our participants that are telling us they have a plan to, uh, um, to apply their learning. That is over 800 participants that have gone through our SLT throughout the year are telling us that they have a plan and that 91% of those teachers are telling us that their learning is strong after the training. For, for that measure, that is 27% increase from before they had training. We asked them what their level of strength was before and it was 27% higher after the training. Those comments on the screen are from our educators who are telling us their successes. You can see that they're very excited about creating a sense of community and belonging at their school. That working with their staff and hearing student voice is a positive part of the system. That they're excited about the district um, behavior and social emotional learning focus and what that is doing about bringing those together. 
But we also have educators that tell us this is hard work, that there are challenges to do this work, and we want to honor what our um, colleagues are telling us. They're telling us that leading and managing change is complex and difficult to do on their campuses, that trying to get everybody on their campus to buy into what they're doing is something that they need to continue to have support with, or balancing all three, social emotional learning, behavior, and academics is something that they need support with. These comments help us to design professional learning experiences and uh, support with our MTSS staff so that we can bridge those gaps to help bring about success. We were going to share some voices from the field. I have their comments and if you would allow me, I'll just share just a couple of things that they were going to say. Principal uh, Brown from Harrison was going to share that at Harrison, they want to create a place where students want to be and a place that students are engaged and they want to come every day. This year, their theme is Mario Brothers and their motto is breaking barriers and leveling up. They want every student at Harrison to diligently work to level up their skills. Students at Harrison earn rewards for positive behavior and for attendance, and all of their staff members are able to reward students. Students at Harrison have two school-wide systems that they use, and Miss Shelley Miller, who is their library media assistant, is very integral in helping this process to become a success. Students earn points and they can shop in the Tiger Store to receive anything from chips or coins or buy snacks that they can have during morning recess as a tangible reward for demonstrating those behaviors that their system has agreed that they want to do. She included a little data she wanted me to share. This year before they started their positive behavior program, they had 175 office referrals and 48 suspensions last year. Since they've started this, they have 16 office referrals and only seven suspensions. That's a dramatic increase, uh, excuse me, decrease in those negative outcomes, which means there was a dramatic increase in the level of support that was provided to students. Their positive behavior support program is at the heart of what they do at Harrison Elementary School. We were going to have Monica Gray speak to you. She is one of our MTSS liaisons. Our MTSS liaisons support teachers to support students in the classroom. She works as a liaison very close to her principal, Mr. Robinson, um, with all the teachers to ensure optimal effectiveness of tier one instruction. That's first instruction in the classroom. She works to focus on the rigor of the content within every single classroom at her school. She helps to coordinate professional learning within both small and large groups, and she has trained over 36 staff members just in the use of universal screeners alone this year. She supports um, the use of data to not only um, inform current steps, but to inform next steps through our cycle of inquiry process. She is integral in uh, helping to support the district priorities or what we lovingly refer to as the big four for her teachers with purposeful collaboration among the staff. She wants to thank some instructional services partners that include Anisha Camacho, Rochelle Kanatsar, Debbie Jane Hutchinson, who is here with us today, who is a phenomenal resource that helps her to help her teachers uh, at her school. And so as we wrap up the presentation, we just wanted to share a couple of uh, actions that'll be upcoming. For the spring, we will have one more round of universal screeners at the elementary, and we have included the middle school this round, so we are up through K through eight with universal screening. We are working to bring our year three actions to our principals and go through our series of uh, focus groups to have consistent uh, cohesion into what we're going to accomplish next year. Next year's focus will be on high quality tier one academic instruction and supporting our teachers to uh, do that to the best of their ability. 
and next year, we're very excited that we will be implementing universal screeners in the high school in a targeted fashion in order to provide teachers with additional information to support their students in grades nine through 12. And at that, I will step aside for any public comments and take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sosa, for that presentation. I'll turn to Trustee Hunt. We have one comment card from Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. Hey, you have a nice empty room now. Would have been nice for the parents that were here to have been able to hear that presentation. But I think a lot of the times this district, you know, I sat through six hours of your board training um, and I really would have thought that you would have realized that what the community wants to hear and what you're prioritizing are not the same things. You guys spent the first hour and a half patting yourselves on the back, great jobs, congratulate everybody, which is fine, but you spent an hour and a half doing that. And then when parents showed up to speak, you cut them off. And now you're talking about an important topic and there's nobody in this room. So multi-tiered system of supports. The presentation, again, very weak on data. So 60% expected growth. Does that mean that when we get these state testing, it's going to be 60% increased, that the numbers are going to be that high? What is that expected growth based on? There's, again, never any actual data presented with these reports. It's just these numbers that are meaningless. And I think that's how you're hiding a lot of these failures, but you can't hide it when the state testing comes out. So. I mean, I would hope that I'm not the only one saying that there's a problem with this presentation, that you see it also, and that you see, okay, positive behavior. Let's, let's talk about how this positive behavior is working. So um, I get told by kids, because I know a lot of kids in a lot of your different schools, and they tell me the streaks. Hey, we had a whole week of fights every day, multiple fights every day. How's this positive behavior working out? Yeah, maybe in the elementary, sure. Let's talk about high schools. I noticed there weren't any comments from any high schools. Um, I would have loved to have hear how many of these principals are, are feeling this positive behavior is working. We obviously saw how it's working at King, that this positive behavior is not working with the students. Yeah, it's not working. Did all these parents not send you that message, Mr. Hunt? It's not working. Um, you're not protecting students, you're not focusing on the discipline, you're going back because the state is telling you, you, you have to worry about what the kid's race is, what the kid's gender is, what the, in terms of punishment. If a kid is causing problems in the school, nothing else should matter. If they're causing problems, fine. I'm all for, you know, trying positive measures first, and if it works, great. You know, but if it's not working, what's the cutoff? One strike, two strike, three strikes? Parents need to know that there will be accountability and that you will not be placing their kids in danger. So it's great that you have these wellness centers to help the kids, you know, de-escalate. But at the end of the day, when it's a repetitive behavior by one student, there has to be measures that parents can count on that we can say, okay, well, there was one fight. There was two fights. Now kids expelled, not moved to another school. If this kid shows up at Arlington. Thank you, Ms. Harp. Okay, we'll start with Trustee Hunt. Um, I, I felt the staff did very well. Thank you for the review we had for several hours, and, and I'm excited about this. Uh, I take the speaker's comments uh, with, a grain of, with a lump of salt because uh, they are factless. But I'm so glad she mentioned that, you know, that her favorability for wellness centers, which are so important. And uh, though there's decorum is, is lacking as well. But uh, I'm, I'm very glad about that and where you're going. Uh, yes, the test scores will tell us, but to think that RUSD is the only one having challenges, you need to go talk to Rhode Island and Tallahassee and Baton Rouge and just, just work your way back. So California is this. So we know that absenteeism has increased prior, prior, prior to the pandemic nationally. Absenteeism is 5% of the days that a, a student would miss. It has increased nationally to 10%. So we're in a different era, and I believe your, your plan helps uh, address that, and I'm prepared to uh, support it. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Trustee Hunt. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. 
Did one of your um, educators stick around for comment? Because if they did, would, do you, would, would, is, can, would you like to say something? So, okay. if, if this were like seven o'clock, she was going to be a part of your presentation? No, this is actually uh, just, a not, not just, this is another one of our providers who came just to support her colleagues who were here. Oh, wonderful. Well, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. let's <laughs> you stayed this late, why not? Yes. Why not let, hear from you? My name is Debbie Jane Hutchinson. I have the privilege of being an inclusive practices specialist, which means I support teachers who support our exceptional children. And so that we can, as you saw in the data, keep these exceptional children in a general education class so they can learn with their peers, access content, and then we support those educators with strategies to help with behaviors and scaffolding so that children feel successful and their families feel that they are successful. So that's, that's what we do. Thank you. And then I really did have a question on one of the slides. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you for, for staying with us. Slide number 10, can you explain that a little bit? I think it's, it's the slide that says universal screening grades uh, K through six reading and math. And this is the expected growth, 56 and 54. Um, can you explain a little bit more of how we measured that growth or how we're gonna measure that growth? Sure. Uh, can we pull that presentation up? Number 10. There it is. Uh, oh, the other one. The other 10. There we are. There are, two ten. There are, two ten, or 11. There are. It's the no, second 10, which is 11. The second 10. OK, that one. Uh, well, the one I'm looking at says 56 uh, in reading and 54 in. We, those numbers were updated just this week okay. with the most recent data. Oh, OK. Right. OK, great. So the universal screeners look at where, how a student's doing in base skills, uh, base skills according to their grade level, which is different than standards. It's not looking at if a student can achieve standard RL, you know, 5.1, which is a fifth grade standard that has to do with reading literature, right? It's if, it's if students are ready for high quality instruction. So nationally, 60% is the average, meaning that 60% uh, of students made either growth uh, that they scale out on um, a scale and it's in quota, uh, it, it's in percentiles rather. So it's students who are between the 50th and the 99th percentile is what we call, ex or what the system terms expected growth. So our students are right in that ballpark within the 50, the 50th to the 99th percentile. So they're making average growth to, to growth that's 49% higher than the average growth there. What it essentially tells us is that the, um, the interventions, the small group instruction, the things that are happening in the classrooms to get students ready for instruction, that they're hitting their mark. We want every student to be at grade level. And, but we know that some students take a little bit longer to get there than, than others do. And that's why we look at growth, especially in the middle of the year, and not if they have achieved the year end expectation in April. I don't know if I answered the question. It's a, it can get very jargony, <laughs> and I'm trying my best to, to make it not as jargony. You, you finished? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. I'll turn it to Trustee Kinnear. I could probably use a remedial course on what you just described because I'm not quite getting it, and now's not the time to uh, to do it. But uh, but uh, but I would like some some extra help on what that means. Uh, one one pet peeve is that uh, is that when we talk about fiscal implications, we say none, and I recognize why we say none because you're not proposing to us that we add right now. But we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on uh, on this, and uh, and and I think we should we should be reminded of uh, of how much we we've, we've invested uh, so that 
uh, we eventually see the return in that uh, in that investment uh, as it relates to student achievement. And I know it takes time, and we've talked about uh, how these practices take time, but eventually we have to see, are we getting our money's worth out of, uh, out of, out of all these dollars? I also have a pet peeve, and, I, and you've heard me say this before, uh, about some of the data that we use. Uh, a very specific example is, uh, is inclusive behavior, and I'm happy and I'm pleased that we're including more special needs students in the regular program. But if we're not measuring whether they're being successful or not, it doesn't, it doesn't really help us to know that we're putting more kids with special needs in a regular class uh, when we don't know how are they doing and, uh, and is, is, this, is this a good thing? Maybe, maybe it's a bad thing. Um, we, we hope not, we expect that it's not, uh, but without, without you know, having some kind of data to support uh, a, achievement, um, then a number like that uh, doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot to at least, at least me. So that, that's my quick comments. Thank you. Is, is it something you want, you're gonna respond to or? No. Okay. <laughs> I just appreciate the feedback. Okay, but we do, we do have data about the the efficacy of having the inclusive practice with special needs students, correct? Yes. We just don't have it to, to report at this exact moment, is that? Yes, I don't have the exact numbers here in the notes, but we did see uh, previously in a presentation that outcomes for students with disabilities uh, on the um, state assessments for that aggregate group did increase in both reading and mathematics. So it is something we can pull some of that data for you. Also in the report on the LCAP, that the outcome data is also being included in that. If we could just send that in a mail out, that'd be great, thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of comments. Um, the first one is centered around the ed code. I'm just curious, uh, how much does the current state of the ed code, the revisions that are made to the ed code, influencing and driving programmatically the way you're approaching these uh, practices, MTSS? So looking at Education Code 1, research is driving our focus on positive behavior systems and setting those very clear expectations. And then looking at revising our discipline processes that is within what the parameters are of education code. We have both now interventions because the goal is to change behaviors coupled with appropriate consequences matching those pieces. To that point, the, the consequences are very much uh, regimented based on ed code. Uh, in terms of the manner that d discipline is is to be administered, is is, is that a general understanding? In terms of expulsions, there are and some suspensions, there are very clear guidelines on what is expellable, suspendable, and then we also have through our guides and looking at those processes uh, measured in terms of increasing consequences for increasing intensities of behavior. So I, I think, um, you know, I think it was Ms. Lopez that mentioned this earlier. I, I think it would be helpful for, the, for parents to be more familiar with what the ed code, what it, how it pertains specifically to uh, student discipline and just having an understanding of, were you going to say something, Mr. Walker? Uh, that information is available in the education code itself, 48900, 48900. No, no, I, I know that it's available in general. I'm just saying that to making it accessible for, so people don't have to know, you know, where to search for that specific code. And that's, I just mean to make it more accessible, that's all. Okay. Um, so my last question is uh, on this slide 18, uh, honoring challenges. I know you uh, acknowledged these things. I just wanted to get your thoughts about you're, and I know this is kind of like there's a wide range of, of topics covered here, but just generally, what's your response to, to this feedback on the honor, on, uh, regarding the challenges? Leading system change is hard. Uh, changing the 
trajectory of a system that has been going in one direction for a long time and changing adult practice is something that doesn't happen overnight. Um, our, these comments are from our educators who are part of their school teams that are building these on their campus. And so they're learning and seeing firsthand uh, as leaders the difficulty of that. So we want to honor the, uh, that because we know as leaders trying to lead system change, uh, excuse me, system change is difficult. Uh, these are things we talk about almost every single SLT session and helping to be able to provide coaching to our leaders, to provide research-based strategies and supports. Um, we, we've heard from Debbie Jane about having support staff who are right on the school campus, who can walk into the classroom and help coach teachers that are having a difficult time with this. So I um, honor these, but I think we need to recognize that whenever we change something, it's kind of like getting in shape, of which I need to do more of, but you work out a lot at first and it hurts. But then after you do it for a while, it doesn't hurt as much, right? When we change something from one state to the next, there's a growth that needs to happen, and sometimes that hurts. But I think what our educators are saying is, even though it's tough, they recognize it's the right work. It's good work to do, and they're committed to doing it. But what, what would you characterize as the most consistent pain point, for a lack of a better word, to, you know, in reaction to the metaphor you used, uh, regarding these challenges? Probably to get other staff members who are maybe not part of the direct leadership team to get them to understand what we're trying to do and uh, buy into it. That process, I think, that we all share of when, when you're, you're up front and you're leading, you have to motivate those folks behind you, and that's not always uh, easy. But you're doing peer-to-peer -peer efforts to help. Exactly. Okay. Sounds good. Well, th thank you both for your presentation. Uh, that concludes our board comments. So uh, this takes us now to uh, the meeting conclusion. So I'll check with my colleagues if anyone would like to request agenda items for future board meetings. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you. I just would like to uh, ask for some type of report um, with regards to ed code, you know, 48900 and all those pertaining to. I, I think it's a really good idea for us to kind of circle back on a Discipline 101 um, conversation of what, what is possible, what isn't possible, what, what is within the purview of the site leadership to take care of, what, what is not, what is, again, what is ed code? Um, how, much, how much responsibility does the board have or how much agency does the board have on these things? I think that there needs to be some clarification. I would like some clarification. I think the community would like some clarification and I think that it's easily done. No, I, I would. I would like to see some type of report. Sure. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you for that suggestion. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we. Oh, Trustee Kinnear. I would like to add to that uh, uh, Trustee Hunt's comments about the pending legislation with uh, with uh, with suspension uh, and uh, uh, defiance and uh, and do. Do we have a, a position as a district or as a board uh, with, uh, uh, with our legislatures in regard to that pending uh, legislation? Uh, do we agree with that pending legislation? Do we disagree with it? Uh, should we be doing something about that? So one, one just a, a more detail to, uh, to, to what was just said by uh, my fellow trustee. Sure, and the, uh, the, the Trustee Hunt had requested that also, so uh, we will we'll certainly follow up, Trustee Kinnear. Thank you. So uh, hearing no other uh, input then, uh, we adjourn the meeting at 1019.